What were some of the strangest crimes we covered in 2023? Let's get right to it with this marathon video. These are the last people we thought would be doing crimes. Let's get right to it, starting with... Number 6. The Mad Girlfriend Serena Wolf stole her boyfriend's credit card just to leave a $5,000 tip on her breakfast tab. You could probably have guessed why. The New York native was in Florida visiting her boyfriend, Michael Crane, when the couple had a fight about money. Crane and Wolf had the argument after she asked to use his credit card to buy a flight back to New York, but Crane refused. The little argument must have been pretty significant, though, because Crane put a hold on his credit account, worried that Wolf would try to use his card anyway. He did quickly lift it, though, probably thinking he was just overreacting. Wolf then treated herself to breakfast at the Clear Sky Cafe the next morning with his card she somehow nabbed. Although her meal cost $55.37, she decided to leave a $5,000 tip. When Crane noticed the charge on his card, he confronted Wolf, but she denied using it. So he called his credit card company to report the charge as fraudulent. In response, the credit card company contacted the restaurant to report the charge, but the establishment had already paid out the server who was going through a hard time after her service dog passed away. So Crane filed a police report where he claimed Wolf may have been drunk at the time of the transaction and was trying to get back at him. She was arrested on a $2,000 bond. If we had to bet, we're pretty sure they broke up. Number five, punting money. Former soccer star Richard Rufus, who played for Charlton Athletic, scammed friends and family out of millions of dollars in a Ponzi scheme to support his lavish lifestyle. Rufus stole roughly $19 million, but only $9 million ever went to his trading account where he promised investors huge returns. He used the rest to either pay off other investors and for his own use. Rufus lived in a five-bedroom house on a private estate, drove a Bentley, and wore a Rolex, all funded with investor money. Rufus portrayed himself as a successful foreign exchange trader who could generate significant profits in the currency markets. The heartless retired athlete targeted his own friends and family, luring them with promises of high interest, low risk investments with 60% returns annually. Rufus presented himself as such an expert on the topic that he had created his own trading style and methodology and said it was those factors that led to his success. He said that his ultimate goal was to create a legacy by helping helping others become wealthy. Rufus also told potential investors that major financial institutions like Barclays Bank, Coots Bank, and other soccer players had invested with him, but couldn't give details as the information was confidential. Former Chelsea defender Paul Elliott was on the board of Charlton Athletic's Charitable Trust, which Rufus became an ambassador for after a knee injury forced him into retirement. Elliott ended his own successful soccer career with a similar injury, so the two bonded and became friends. Elliott helped Rufus navigate life after soccer and learned about Rufus's trading methodology a few years into their friendship. It seemed Rufus was an expert in his field, having raised millions for his church and working with other soccer players. While he didn't give Elliot the names of any of his investors, he implied that Elliot would be familiar with them. Over the course of three years, Elliot gave Rufus $540,000, and he appeared to make a profit of $40,000 through his investment. But the money didn't come from trading. Rufus paid him out using money from other investors in a classic pyramid scheme move. Construction engineer Vincent Nairn met Rufus when he renovated Rufus's home. The pair became close, and Rufus offered Nairn the opportunity to earn significant money by investing with him. Rufus explained that he spent a lot of time and money on training to be proficient in foreign exchange trading. He had become an expert in trading and made a lot of money for other people and companies. Since Rufus appeared to live a lavish and expensive lifestyle, Nairn was sold on 
on the idea, so why not give it a shot? Nairn gave Rufus about $15,000 with the expectation that he would make roughly $536 a month on his investment. Rufus said the investment could yield roughly $7 million over 12 years and promised he would cover any of Nairn's losses. It sounded like a no-lose situation. But after the investment, Rufus confessed that he didn't have approval from the Financial Services Authority, known as the FSA, but claimed he could still trade while awaiting approval. However, his trading accounts were eventually frozen. He told Nairn he couldn't accept any more funds, claiming there were discrepancies with the trades that took place, but never gave any specific details. Rufus insisted Nairn would get his money back as long as he signed a document claiming that Rufus didn't owe him any money which was certainly not a red flag. Nairn was putting down a new carpet in Rufus's home when the FSA turned up to repossess the property. After a brief trial, Rufus was found guilty of fraud, money laundering, and carrying out a regulated activity without authorization. He got seven and a half years. Rufus fooled a lot of people with his scam, probably after all those years honing his acting skills playing soccer. Number four, buy, sell, fakes. Senior citizen Mayo Gilbert McNeil ripped off $800,000 from unsuspecting people by selling fake sports cards. Nobody expects to be scammed by a kind-looking old man, which was exactly how McNeil was able to do it. The 82-year-old senior citizen from Colorado lured sports trading enthusiasts through the internet and online selling platforms. He offered an impressive collection of trading cards, such as valuable 1986 Fleer Michael Jordan rookie cards. McNeil told buyers that the cards were graded by a professional authentication company, which they were not, mainly because they weren't real. Over four years, McNeil's victims spent hundreds of thousands of dollars buying the fake cards, some trading authentic cards for McNeil's fake ones. One victim spent $4,500 for one of the fake Michael Jordan cards, and another sent McNeil two authentic Tom Brady football cards in exchange for two fake Jordan ones. McNeil's scam operated nationwide until the FBI collaborated with the NYPD to bring him down. Authorities arrested McNeil in Denver and charged him with conspiracy to commit wire fraud. He's expected to be arraigned in New York City at a later date. Number three, the German scam East Efficient, ya? Gerard Bauer allegedly stole money from his company to build a boutique winery farm and horse ranch on his Virginia property. The German national funneled over $4 million from his employer, which is believed to be industrial firm Frenzilit, as he was listed as the firm's U.S. subsidiary. Over seven years, Bauer used corporate checks to pay for his personal expenses. He created fake invoices to make the transactions appear legitimate and business-related. Bauer took one and a half million dollars to fund the construction of his private enterprises, Goose Creek Farm and Otium Winery, and his horse ranch based in Purcellville, Virginia. Otium Cellars offers German and Austrian wines, and Bauer also used some of his company's funds to buy hundreds of bottles for the winery. New owners purchased the company a few years later and reimagined it as Otium Winery. Bauer's Farm raised and sold Hanoverians, a horse breed that originated in Germany. On top of his business expenses, Bauer spent $146,416 for private school fees at Foxcroft School, a boarding school for girls. He also used $357,683 to pay off his credit card debt. Bauer was indicted on several charges, including mail fraud and embezzlement. He pleaded guilty to the embezzlement charges and faces a maximum of 20 years in prison. He probably should have just offered up the remaining business to his old bosses. If he just started sharing all the profits, he might have gotten away with it. Number two, Prince Opal? Former high school principal, Hilary French, made fake expense claims so she could embezzle school funds. French worked at Newcastle High School for Girls, a private school in Northern England, where tuition is $18,000 a year. French ran her scam for nearly two years. During that time, she submitted a series of expense claims for 65 gift cards from John Lewis, a British luxury department store. French said the gift cards were for gifts for coworkers, rewards for high-performing students, or thank you gifts for gifts guest speakers. She claimed a total of $3,800 in expenses for the cards. Towards the end of her career at the school, she traveled to the city of Bath to support the school's hockey team during a competition. When she returned, French told the school she shared meals with former students who were either studying at Bath University or other nearby colleges and submitted $300 in claims for meal expenses. 
However, while she did travel to Bath, French didn't spend time with the hockey team or former students. The girls she claimed she spent time with all said they hadn't seen the principal since they graduated. The school found out about the scam when French accused somebody of stealing an expensive coat. She said she ordered a designer coat to be shipped to the school, which was delivered but immediately stolen. It costs around $300 and she submitted a claim for it. However, the police recovered the allegedly stolen item from French's trunk, which they searched after she made the allegation. She was arrested, but denied any wrongdoing in her police interview. In court, she pleaded guilty to three counts of fraud. The Girls' Day School Trust, which governs her former employer, released a statement acknowledging her misuse of power. During her trial, the judge condemned her actions, tarnishing her long career as a teacher and role model. While French avoided jail time, she did receive a six-month sentence, suspended for one year and 150 hours of unpaid work. French also had to pay back a portion of money she stole. And who had that kind of relationship with their school principal where they would bump into you in a college and take you out to dinner? A teacher? Maybe, but a principal? Isn't it usually the kids in trouble all the time that knew the principal? Number one, happy landings. A group of flight attendants moonlighted as escorts and charged wealthy clients thousands of dollars for their services. Voi Tai Han, a flight attendant for Vietnam Airlines, oversaw the operation. She employed the women and negotiated with clients, offering them at the hotel for $1,000 to $3,000 a night. Han recruited attractive flight attendants and sent customers images of them in their uniforms. She contacted some of her former co-workers to offer them extra income during layovers in Vietnam and scouted local models. Han also posted pictures of herself on yachts and staying at luxury destinations around the world on social media. She shared images of herself working as a cabin crew for Vietnamese Airlines where she welcomed customers and luxury guests. Although she appeared to be a flight attendant who enjoyed a jet-setting lifestyle, law enforcement believed her posts were a ruse to draw other women in to work on her scam. Once clients picked their favorite cabin crew member, they transferred money to Han, who would arrange the meeting between the men and women. Han employed at least 30 women, most of whom were flight attendants. The operation was lucrative, and Han was able to quit her job as a cabin crew member to run the ring full time. Over the course of a few months, she made roughly roughly $42,000. Han charged clients a $290 booking fee plus $991 for a 90-minute session or $2,972 for an overnight stay. Police raided a luxury hotel in Ho Chi Minh City where they discovered three flight attendants and one model spending time with different men. Officers arrested the women along with their madam, Han. There has to be a massage parlor joke somewhere in there, but we're not making it. What are some of the weirdest crimes criminals will come up with? Let's find out, starting with... Number six, Mannequin 3, going to jail. A guy from Poland had the bright idea of pretending to be a mannequin just to rob a store. But his mannequin act was caught on CCTV, and this time... 80s heartthrob William Ragsdale wasn't around to save him. The scam was simple, even if a bit tedious. The man came into the store, found a great spot to stand, and then pretended he was a mannequin for hours. He was able to do this because the store was large and because his motionless act wasn't bad. After the staff of the store had closed down the store with him in it, and the mannequin magically came to life and sprang into action just like the hit 80s film series. He came with his bag and then burgled the jewelry store for all it was worth. He was eventually caught and held for three months. The owner of the store said that the man wasn't a first time thief. He was known in the area as a frequent robber and there was one documented case of him robbing another nearby store. In that case, he'd found his way into another store after grabbing a meal at a nearby bar. He made sure he waited until the store closed before he burgled it. Once he was in that store, he grabbed all the designer clothes he could find. After he was done, he stopped again at another bar to grab a meal. But a security guard caught up to him before calling the police. So what's the fate of our winner of the stealing mannequin challenge? Well, he's currently being held by the police and faces at least 10 years of jail if convicted of burglary and theft. What exactly was his exit plan? To just smash out of the front and alert the police? 
And how did no one notice that there's suddenly a mannequin that wasn't there before? Didn't the person in charge of that department take a look at it all during the entire shift? If we did it, we'd be a mannequin with sunglasses so we could blink. Number five, hamster hotels. Ryan Sentel State released live hamsters in his hotel room in a ridiculous ploy to get a free stay. And Ryan didn't just do this at one hotel location. He repeated the same scam at multiple locations and caused thousands of dollars worth of property loss for the hotels. The scam was simple. Ryan would go into the hotels with hamsters and then let them loose in the room. Afterwards, he would point out rodent droppings to the staff and demand a refund. The hotels then had to spend thousands of dollars to get rid of the hamsters that Ryan had introduced, but it was the cutest infestation anyone had ever seen. This scam worked in at least two hotels where he tried it. However, his luck eventually ran out. The police soon found out about his tricks and arrested him. Once he was arrested, another hotel manager spoke up about Ryan pulling the same scam at their hotel. According to the manager, it costs $159 per night to stay at the hotel, and Ryan had scammed them out of two nights' stay. The police aren't quite sure, but they believe that Ryan must have pulled the same scam at more hotels in the area. Right now, he faces two charges of theft by deception and three counts of criminal mischief. But what we want to know is, did anyone get to pick up and pet the hamsters? Or give them stuff to put in their cheeks? Like, if you're in a hotel room and you see droppings, you're going to be super pissed, right? But then it's like this cute little hamster scurrying by and maybe you get to pet it. Number four, win my home. Loretta Buchanan thought she'd won a two million pound dream house in a raffle draw, but she was wrong. She only won 5,000 pounds, and now she's calling the entire raffle a scam because she wasn't given a house. The raffle draw in question was something called the Win My Home Raffle. The point of the raffle was to get people to buy tickets and then purchase a particular mansion with the bought tickets. The mansion would then be given to the winner of the lottery. Unfortunately, that's not quite how it went down. Loretta, who was a newly married school teacher, teacher hadn't wanted to enter the draw, but she entered it at the last minute and spent £10 buying 10 tickets during the final weekend of the raffle. She was announced as the winner, and she thought it meant she would get her home. The owner of the house that was supposed to go to Loretta was this guy named Elliot Andrew. It turned out that Andrew was dating the director of the raffle, Yevenia Levitska, and so he had a connection to the firm behind the whole scheme. He'd been dating Levitska for at least five years, and the duo had gone on a bunch of expensive vacations, which, like, like, you can see how that's looking a little shady. The firm organizing the lottery was registered at Andrew's home before its address was changed a few months later. The plan was that the draw would raise the money to buy Andrew's home, and Andrew would then give the home to the winner of the draw. But that would only happen if enough tickets were bought. Sadly, they weren't. The firm had a target of selling two and a half million pounds of tickets to buy the two million pound home, but that target wasn't reached. Since it wasn't reached, there was no home to hand over to Loretta. In a show of goodwill, Andrew drove over to Loretta's house himself to break the disappointing news. He explained that she didn't win, but said he would give a consolation prize of £5,000. He reasoned that would more than make up for the £10 she spent on the tickets for the raffle, and apparently the raffle had lost money, so the money, the £5,000, actually came from personal pocketbooks. But Loretta didn't quite agree with that logic. Instead, she complained about several things. First, she said that the firm didn't inform her about her win properly. She said that Andrew just drove drove over to her home and just gave her a bottle of Prosecco when she could have at least gotten champagne, which honestly sounds like she's just mad. Andrew explained that the conditions of getting the home were stated in the lottery's terms and conditions, and Loretta said she wasn't aware of the terms. In any case, she accepted the money Andrew gave her, but she later gave an interview to a local newspaper saying she felt that the lottery was a scam. In the interview, she said that the competition was a scandal and that she was looking into whether she had legal recourse. Of course, this annoyed Andrew and the firm, who then threatened to claw back the 5000 pounds Loretta had been given. In a separate interview, Andrew outlined his version of things and said his only connection to the draw was that his house was the prospective prize if everything went well. He also said that the firm didn't defraud Loretta as it was clearly stated that she would only get the house if the lottery raised enough money. So who do you think was in the wrong here? Were the organizers of the lottery fraudulent or did they just stick to their policy? Was Loretta just too busy to read the rules of the competition? Or was there some shady business going on since the firm did raise two 
million pounds, but still claimed they lost money. While we think it's a good thing that Loretta got even 5,000 pounds out of the deal, we can understand how that could feel a little scammy. She was more than reimbursed for the money she spent on the ticket, given that the lottery didn't reach its money-raising goal, so Loretta did come out ahead. Tell us what you think in the comments below. Number three, hand insurance. Miguel Blasquez Palacios did the unthinkable when he hacked off his hand in a bid to defraud an insurance firm. Miguel was dealing with a lot of debts, so he decided that the smart thing to do was to stage a car accident that would remove the hand. To do this, he detached his hand and disposed of it, placed a tourniquet around the limb, and then drove his car off the road. Then he lit the car on fire and called emergency services. The first sign that something was wrong was when a policeman arrived at the scene and met Miguel enjoying a smoke. Miguel told the police that he had swerved to avoid an animal on the road before crashing. He also said that a metal bar had smashed through the windscreen and sliced his hand off. Before the accident, Miguel had taken out 11 different insurance policies with 8 different firms. If his scam had worked out, he would have earned close to $3 million in insurance payouts. Unfortunately, Miguel wasn't the best storyteller. His insurers became suspicious of his story when they learned that he'd taken out so many policies shortly before his accident and that he had had a mountain of debt. They sent private investigators after him, and the investigators revealed that the cut his arm had suffered was too clean to have been done by an accident. By then, Miguel had already gotten 300,000 pounds of his total payout. He was arrested by the police and made to repay the firms he'd already collected insurance payouts from. He was also jailed for three years for his troubles. So he didn't get any insurance money, got three years in jail, and he also lost his right hand. Now that's just the worst case scenario for his scam. We all almost feel bad for this guy. Almost. Number two, wait, defense attorneys lie? John Scarpa has been accused of bribing a witness to get his client off the hook. John Scarpa was meant to defend his client, a man named Reginald Ross, a member of the LA-based Crips. Ross was on trial for the passing of two men. One was of Raymond Hertz, a road crew flagman who Ross said had delayed him at a stop. After the delay, Ross tracked Hertz for a week before ending his life right in his car. This guy is a real sweetheart. The second man was John Williams, whose life was ended the same way. Ross mistook John John as the man he was after, his original target, John's brother, Scott Williams. Ross hoped that Scott's funeral would draw out yet another man who owed him money for illegal substances, and then he planned to take that guy out at the funeral too. It sounds like a story straight out of the wire, right? The prosecution had a lot of evidence against Ross and had two primary witnesses willing to implicate him. One of them was Lewis Cherry, Ross's friend. Cherry had earlier told the police that he had helped Ross plan Williams' passing. Scarpa's plan to get Ross off the hook was to place the blame squarely on Cherry. So he had an ex-con, who was also a private investigator, get in touch with Cherry and bribed him to take the fall. The ex-con private investigator, a man named Charles Gullman, told Cherry that he would get a lot of street cred in the big house for his handling of Williams and Hertz. So Cherry goes for it, gets on the stand, and recants his testimony about helping Ross be a horrible human. Cherry insisted that he was the lone bad guy in the assassination. However, even that didn't help Ross get off the hook. The prosecution had had one other primary witness whom Ross had confided in and had phone records that provided that Ross had indeed committed the crimes. In the end, he was sentenced to 74 years in jail. Afterwards, officials discovered what Scarpa and Gallman had done. They were soon charged with violating the Federal Travel Act for allegedly using cell phones in the bribery scheme. Which is so dumb because Scarpa was getting paid anyway. Why mess with that? Number one, heart-stopping meals. A man only known to the internet as Aiden J faked a lot of heart attacks for a lot of free food. His scam was simple. When he was done with his meal or had eaten his fill, he would clutch his heart, fall to the floor, and start shaking in fake agony. Of course, this would alarm the restaurant staff who would then be pressured into foregoing the bill for the meal. Aiden did this scam several times at different restaurants in the area and it always worked. Who's going to charge someone that just had a heart attack? Since Aiden always pretended to be a Russian tourist who didn't speak the language and always or designer clothes, people didn't readily catch on to his scam. Aiden had been caught and recognized many times for his little play, but was never really detained since the amounts he was stealing were so low. Most times they came up to around 15 to 70 euro, so it was easy for the restaurants to write it off. However, Aiden was caught when he tried the same trick in the restaurant twice. The staff instantly realized that he was faking it and handed him over to the police. He was then fined and jailed for 42 days. It's a lot easier to get a free meal just by saying you found a hair in it, right?
What are some of the weirdest crimes people come up with? Let's find out, starting with... Number seven, opportunity costs. Jennifer White, a lady who was, shall we say, a professional of sorts, was offering her unique services to willing customers. One evening, Jennifer's client had a change of heart. Maybe it was the guilt, or perhaps he realized he was short on cash. Who knows? The point is, he decided he didn't want those services anymore. Instead, he handed Jennifer a meager 15 pounds to cover her taxi fare. Jennifer seemed cool with this change of plan, happily accepted the money, and headed for the exit. No harm, no foul, right? Wrong. David Donald, Jennifer's partner in crime, came a-knocking. He demanded cash from the bewildered client for wasting Jennifer's time. But the client, remember, had just coughed up his last few pounds. With Donald breathing down his neck, the client had no choice but to start transferring money into a bank account. Jennifer and Donald eventually left, and they made a clean getaway with their ill-gotten gains. But here's where they played themselves. The victim later realized his car keys had vanished, along with his BMW. Now, don't get us wrong, we're no criminal masterminds, but it would seem like stealing a car after you've just extorted someone seems like a one-way ticket to getting caught. And, wouldn't you know it, it was. Jennifer's DNA was all over the car steering wheel, and there was no denying it. Jennifer managed to escape jail and was placed on a structured deferred sentence for three months. But the judge warned her that she could still end up behind bars if she didn't play her cards right during this probationary period. On the flip side, David Donald didn't fare quite as well. He was sentenced to 13 months. Number six, Shoeless Joe? For six years, a sneaky bandit crept around a neighborhood in Australia, sticking to a roughly 15-mile radius. He had a peculiar preference for targeting shoes left outside people's front doors. Now, you've got to wonder, what kind of mental disorder makes someone sniff around only for shoes, especially stinky old work boots? Imagine coming home after a long day at work, kicking up your boots, and leaving them by the door. You'd think they're safe, right? Nope, not in this neighborhood. This guy was out there collecting work boots like they were precious gems. Eventually, the police arrested him, and when they raided his place and uncovered a stash that'll make your jaw drop, 2,416 pairs of stolen shoes. But they weren't even Jordans or anything cool. They were just your regular, everyday work boots and sneakers. Police assembled the footwear in Epping Memorial Hall in Melbourne and victims were encouraged to come look for their lost boots. As for the alleged culprit, he's been hit with charges of theft and handling stolen goods. Now, the big question that's been baffling everyone, why on earth would someone do this? Number five, take me back. Abbe Holmes, back in 2020, was a 20-year-old former college football player. He decided to pose as a homeless 14-year-old named Awan Thomas, conning a kind-hearted woman into taking him in. Abbe started by convincing an unnamed woman from Millenville, Georgia, that he was a homeless teen in need of shelter. She took him in, being all kind-hearted and everything. Abbe was enrolled in Baldwin County High School under his Awan Thomas alias, virtually learning, of course, thanks to the pandemic. Just a few days into his scheme, Abe started acting up, so the woman kicked him out. So Abe decided he was taking his virtual learning tool, aka the school's laptop, with him. The woman tried to get the laptop back, but he refused. Things escalated, and she ended up calling the cops. The police showed up, and the Department of Family and Child Services got involved because Abe claimed he was a homeless teen. When they fingerprinted the 14-year-old Awan Thomas, it turns out he wasn't a kid at all. He was a 21-year-old who once had a shot at college football stardom. But that dream crashed and burned after he got caught up in some car break-ins. So why would Abe pull off such a bizarre stunt? Well, that's the million dollar question. Maybe he thought high school was a blast, or perhaps he just wanted to relive those awkward teenage years? Who knows? In the end, no high school students were in danger, and Baldwin County just had to deal with this strange case of a grown-up pretending to be a teenager. Abe Holmes now sits in the Baldwin County Jail after being charged with giving a false name and making false statements on documents. Number four, way too nice. 
Imagine you meet someone through mutual friends, and they tell you they've got terminal brain cancer. You're kind-hearted, so you open your home and heart to the stranger, thinking they're on their last days. That's what happened to Linda and Steve Evans in Egg Harbor, New Jersey. They welcomed Kylie White into their lives, believing she had limited time left. For over five weeks, they thought they were caring for a terminal soul. Every day, White claimed she was off to medical appointments, but it turns out she was just going to babysitting gigs. At night, White would pull out her best performance, moaning and groaning like she was suffering. She even posed as her own nurse, sending Linda text messages with instructions on how to care for her. The whole charade finally started to unravel when the Evans family heard whispers of a cancer scam involving a woman named Kylie White in nearby Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. That's when they decided enough was enough, and they called the police. White ended up getting arrested just as she was returning from one of her make-believe appointments. She was charged with theft by deception and harassment. It turns out that White had pulled off similar stunts before in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Police said she preyed on the kindness of strangers, getting goods and services without ever facing the consequences. The Evans family spent around $1,000 on White, but they say it was more the emotional toll that really hit them hard. Number three, students for Trump. John Lambert, who was fresh out of college, decided he was going to embark on a career in law, but he never actually went to law school. Lambert was just a regular guy. Well, as regular as anyone can be when they're starting a fake lawyer gig. He hailed from Knoxville, Tennessee, and created a website for a non-existent law firm called Pope and Dunn. To really sell the act, Lambert came up with his alter ego, Eric Pope, claimed to be a New York University Law School grad with 15 years of experience in corporate and patent law. And to add a little flair, he also threw in a finance degree from the University of Pennsylvania. But what's even weirder is that Lambert's scam wasn't even about raking in piles of cash. He did that too, but that's not what it was about. It was more about status, the allure of being a lawyer, and, well, maybe the thrill of deception. Lambert first gained notoriety when he founded Students for Trump, a group aimed at rallying young supporters for then-presidential candidate Donald Trump. Lambert, along with a classmate, would regularly appear on TV and give interviews and and ran the Students for Trump Twitter account. Lambert's legal escapades went on for two years, where he was providing legal advice, all while having zero qualifications. This guy managed to swindle people out of $46,000. Of course, all cons have to come to an end eventually. Lambert got caught, and he didn't even put up a fight when he appeared in a Manhattan federal court. As part of his plea deal, Lambert agreed not to appeal any sentence of 21 months or less behind bars. He also had a kiss goodbye $46,654. When Lambert got arrested, his former buddies at Students for Trump wasted no time distancing themselves from him. They expressed their disappointment and fully condemned Lambert's actions. It seems that to Lambert, the scheme was less about getting money and more about the status that comes with being a lawyer. And while it's pretty cool to say that you're a lawyer, is it $46,000 and 21 months behind bars worth of cool? Number two, fajitas for cheap. A delivery driver for an unusual encounter when he arrived at the Cameron County Juvenile Detention Center with a hefty 800-pound load of fajitas. To his surprise, the kitchen staff at the detention center questioned the delivery. Why? Because they had never served fajitas to the young residents there. But the driver claimed he'd been making these fajita deliveries to the facility for about nine years. So what's so strange about a fajita delivery? Well, the man behind this whole fajita fiasco was a guy named Gilberto Escamilla, an employee at the detention center. Escamilla had been on a nine-year joyride of ordering mountains of fajitas using county funds and then playing a rather lucrative game of let's sell these on the side. If you're going to smuggle something, why not choose something as delicious as fajitas, right? Escamilla's scam went on without a hitch until that fateful day when the delivery driver decided to spill the beans, so to speak. He called the detention center to give them a heads up about the incoming fajitas. And and the staff knew something was up because fajitas weren't on the menu for juveniles. So they confronted Escamilla, and unsurprisingly, he confessed pretty quickly. You've got to wonder if he realized the gig was up when those delivery truck doors swung open, revealing the mother load of fajitas. The total value of the meat Escamilla had requisitioned and repurposed over nine years? A whopping $1.2 million. In Texas, any theft of over $300,000 is an automatic first-degree felony. But Escamilla wasn't just stealing your everyday groceries. He was stealing while on the clock as a public servant. The judge threw the book at him and gave him a 50-year prison 
prison sentence. Let that sink in for a moment. 50 years. That's essentially a life sentence for a guy whose biggest heist involved fajitas, not bank vaults or art. It's almost absurd when you think about it. But then you remember the $1.2 million price tag on those fajitas, and it becomes less of a punchline and more of a jaw dropper. And you know when the driver showed up and everyone is looking around wondering why all of these fajitas showed up, Gilbert was standing there like, Number one, destroying money. In Australia, a group of alleged criminals devised an unusual scheme, smuggling damaged Australian coins back into the country and laundering them through smart ATMs. You might be thinking, who in their right mind goes through all that trouble for a bunch of coins? Well, these coins were worth over a million dollars. Let's take a closer look at these coins for a sec. We're not talking about a treasure chest filled with shiny gold doubloons. No, these were just regular coins, but they'd been through the ringer, damaged, bad battered and bruised, in fact, they were so beaten up that they were no longer considered legal tender. The gang's grand scheme involved turning these sorry-looking coins into crisp, clean bills. How? By feeding them to smart ATMs, those handy machines you use to withdraw cash or check your balance. Now, you might be wondering, why on earth would anyone go through such lengths for a pile of battered coins? Well, it turns out that the gang had quite the taste for the good life, and they were raking in some serious dough. They had made over a million dollars in just two years. The financial wizards at the Australian Transaction Reports and Analysis Center noticed something fishy. They spotted an unusual influx of damaged coins entering the banking system. So the detectives decided to launch a team dedicated to finding out the source and destination of these mysterious damaged coin packages that were flooding into the country. Working hand in hand with the Australian Border Force and the Mint, they cracked the case wide open. Apparently, those sneaky coin smugglers had been shipping these coins into Australia, disguising them as belt buckles. But the trick didn't work. The police swooped in and seized another consignment at Port Botany, and guess what they found? Two more bulk packages of damaged coins sealed up in rice bags. The arrests came next. A man and a woman were both hit with charges related to dealing with the proceeds of crime. The police alleged that the two were part of a larger criminal syndicate. Apparently, the group was fraudulently obtaining damaged coins, smuggling them into Australia, and then slyly laundering them through smart ATMs scattered across Sydney. The money generated from this strange operation was funneled into multiple bank accounts before vanishing overseas. When the police came knocking, it seemed like the pair didn't handle change well. To coin a phrase, the plan did make a lot of sense though, but now their coin find once someone dropped the dime. They should have considered the consequences. Okay, we'll go now. These have to be some of the weirdest scams that people pull. Let's go ahead and start with number five. Who's your dentist? Crentist? Daniela Slabarin Gonzalez and Victor Bernal were arrested after practicing dentistry without a license in West Miami-Dade, Florida. While illegal dentistry practices aren't highly unusual, the nature of this duo scam was unique. The pair first operated their bogus business out of a blue and white bus that advertised the power of a healthy smile. LeBaron and Bernal wouldn't know exactly how one attains a healthy smile, let alone its power, as they had no formal dentistry training. Yet, the operation still attracted clientele who seemingly didn't have an issue with dentistry on a bus. We're sure it was totally safe. It's not like they were driving the bus while performing unlicensed root canals, which would be totally irresponsible. More recently, Slobaron and Bernal upgraded their operation to a red bus covered by an advertisement for a business called Matthew's Fun Show. But there is nothing fun about this sham. Mostly, children were victims of illegal treatment in the dental office on wheels. Nothing screams quality pediatric dentistry like a big red bus advertising a fun show. Slobaron and Bernal even had an operating website for their mobile dentistry where police were able to find details about the location of the operation and scheduled an appointment for a dental cleaning and a tooth extraction. When police arrived at Davco Storage and Propane, where the bus was parked, 
Bernal met them at the gate and drove them to the bus. Imagine being slightly nervous to get a tooth extraction. So you go to the address the dentist lists and it's storage and propane lot. Then the guy who's going to use dangerous tools inside your mouth meets you at a locked gate and leads you to the very back of the lot where no one can hear you scream for help to pull out your teeth from the inside of a bus. We'd be more worried we'd end up in an ice bath with our kidneys missing. It's like Bernal was wondering how he could make his operation as sketchy as he possibly could. At their appointment, police reported Slobaran as outfitted in a dental bib, protective face guard, and surgical latex gloves. As Slobaran diagnosed, evaluated, and offered to treat the officer, officials moved in and arrested the two. After the arrest, officers searched the bus and found bags containing various prescription drugs, including lidocaine, mepivicane, ibuprofen 600, and other dental products. Bernal was charged with possession with intent to sell, dispense, or deliver drugs without a prescription. Sounds like this pair were busted. Number four, I am Alison Krauss. Almost everyone has heard some sort of story about catfishing, but in this case of 53-year-old Peggy Sue Evers and 75-year-old Don Fulton, Evers never distorted or faked her appearance. Fulton had been lonely after his wife's death, was eager to find companionship through dating apps. Peggy Sue Evers, as Alison Krauss, met Don Fulton on such an app, claiming to be hiding in witness protection, which makes total sense for a famous person in witness protection to tell a stranger online. Poor Don. Evers was able to further convince Fulton that she was the famous country star and 27-time Grammy winner by singing a few tunes. There was absolutely no physical resemblance between country star Alison Krauss and scammer Peggy Sue Evers at all. But the few songs Evers sang to Fulton, along with being deeply lonely, seemed to be enough to convince him. Shortly after they met on the dating app, Evers and Fulton were married, which raises questions as to how Fulton was still fooled at this point. Not long after their marriage, Evers began to drain Fulton's life savings. She also convinced Fulton to sign over the deed to his house and filed a will for him, leaving all his assets to herself as naming her children as his heirs. Evers essentially took everything that Don Fulton had acquired over the course of his 75 years because she's an awful human being, as are all scammers, and she would have continued to do so had the bank not become suspicious. First Security Bank reported a welfare concern to police, saying that Fulton was in poor health and there was reason for concern that he was being taken advantage of. Fulton's bank account went from $45,000 to $5,000 after marrying Evers. Fulton also mentioned signing the deed to his house over, but he didn't know it was put in Evers' name. He thought he was signing it over to his son. Evers was arrested and pleaded guilty to theft by deception and was sentenced to eight years of probation, ordered to pay $73,000 in restitution, return four cars to Fulton, and sign his home back over to him. Despite her deception of a lonesome, overly trusting man, Evers wasn't to receive any jail time. That's until she failed to return Fulton's vehicles within 60 days of her guilty plea. Evers then failed to appear in court and was rearrested at a motel where she was registered under a false name. She was given an additional 257 days in jail and 15 years probation. Maybe Ma Gorg will return to the trash heap from whence she came to live with the other Gorgs. Number three, scammed at first sight. Michelle Karen first put her name on the map during her appearance on Married at First Sight, a popular dating show. The show is less about dating and more of an immediate marriage to a stranger, hearkening back to a simpler time when you didn't have to bother actually knowing someone and could just make a significant commitment based on appearance. You know, like the way the Founding Fathers intended. Michelle's Married at First Sight romance shockingly didn't work out, and afterwards, she returned to her full-time job in policy training. She lost her policy training job after refusing to comply with vaccine mandates and then began to make content for OnlyFans, an adult content website, also the way the Founding Fathers intended. We're looking at you, Mr. Franklin. Sinner. After seeing initial success on OnlyFans, Michelle read an article that claimed several prominent Australian celebrities, including a notable TV host, had endorsed an online brokerage company. She decided to get in on the allegedly golden investment opportunity and began to put her money into it. A lot of her money. But Michelle became suspicious after a few months passed without any of the promised financial returns. As her suspicion grew, Michelle started contacting the brokerage company to ask about her payments. Instead of payments, they sent a handsome financial broker named Charles. 
Charles played into Michelle's longing for love and would send her flowers, chocolates, and words of affirmation, promising that he would fly her out to London so they could be together. The con man even promised her a pony in every color, which is very misleading, because unless we're talking about patterns, isn't there only about four colors? Five? There's not a lot of colors, is what we're saying. This isn't a My Little Pony situation where Charles is going to be buying her 100 ponies. Michelle became more and more enamored with Charles, although she was suspicious of his accent that sounded more South African but she looked past it for love. At the same time Charles was wooing her, the online brokerage firm created fake stocks that made it appear as if Michelle was earning thousands of dollars through her investments. In reality, the brokerage was stealing all her money. The scam fell apart when Michelle had to make an emergency hospital trip following a severe case of pancreatitis. She attempted to withdraw $5,000 to cover her medical bills and her withdrawal was denied. Up to that point, she believed that she had over $180,000 in her bank account. Michelle called Charles, who told her there was an investigation going on at the brokerage and he was unable to access her funds at the time, keeping her on the hook just a little bit longer. Eventually, she put her foot down and insisted that she was leaving the brokerage firm. She was told that the only way she'd get her money back was to put down another $12,000. Michelle truly began to feel the weight of her suspicions and went to the brokerage website to leave negative reviews, which were immediately taken down, increasing her suspicion. At this point, the scammers had also infiltrated Michelle's personal devices after she gave them access via a remote desktop application called AnyDesk. She learned she had been hacked after logging onto her computer to find a website open with a basket full of purchases she had never made. Michelle will never get back the money she lost, but she said that the worst part was being fooled with another failed romance. She said she missed her chats with Charles and was left both broke and brokenhearted. Number two, inmates with benefits. California resident Brandy Iglesias used the names of notorious convicted murderers to collect unemployment benefits, racking up more than $145,000. She also filed for unemployment benefits under her own name, despite being fully employed. Iglesias was employed at a private company that contracted with San Quentin State Prison, where she learned of and stole the identities of killers Scott Peterson and Casey Stainer. Scott Peterson was, well, you probably know the Scott Peterson story. Casey Stainer was convicted after conviction confessing to the murder of four women in Yosemite National Park in 1999. Stainer is still on death row, allowing Iglesias the opportunity to capitalize upon his unemployment benefits. Through her job, Iglesias was able to attain the private information of the convicted criminals and move forward with her scam. Iglesias claimed $18,562 under Peterson's name and $20,194 under Stainer's name. The rest of her fraudulent earnings were gained from her own unemployment benefits, amongst others. Iglesias joined her convict aliases behind bars on October 26, 2022 on 10 charges of grand theft, forgery, identity theft, and making false statements. While most may think that taking the unemployment money of individuals who have committed terrible crimes isn't the worst thing you can do, Iglesias preyed upon a system that aided those heavily impacted by the pandemic. During the pandemic, California, amongst other states, faced unprecedented fraud attempts, and most of the schemes were linked to the emergency federal pandemic unemployment assistance program, a program put in place to ameliorate the financial devastation of pandemic job loss was soiled by crimes committed by those like Iglesias. Such thefts harm families in need, parents left jobless during the pandemic, and people who just struggle to get by. Number one, art becomes con. British native Larissa Watson was a creative director at an interior design firm and had enjoyed a successful art career. Her position in the art world left her known as a refined, upper-class lady with an esteemed reputation. Then, one dreary British day, Watson just up and left. Her family members reported her missing while Watson was on the way to Italy, where she would begin a four-month crime spree throughout the country, culminating in her attempting to steal a 130,000-pound luxury yacht. Watson posted her Italian and travels to social media, enjoying lavish dinners, spa treatments, and hotels without payment. She posted a message on Facebook on Mother's Day saying that she was missing her four children while she was enjoying luxury dinners. She frequently updated her socials, detailing her new lavish lifestyle, and she created one unique post saying that she had been kicked out of a party in Bologna. Watson was first arrested for sneaking into a hotel room and attempting to flee. After her arrest, Watson told the British Embassy that she didn't want to go home and hoped her family and friends would come to Italy. Next, 
next. Watson headed to the spa where she ordered a beauty treatment. She was arrested again and cautioned for not paying the bill. When she was arrested, she had no money or form of identification and appeared to have been living out of her backpack. Despite the likelihood that Watson had been sleeping and living in rough conditions, she was left feeling fresh and rejuvenated after her visit to the spa. All that running out on bills can really take a toll. Watson was ultimately let go by police and continued her crime spree, with her next crime being the biggest. Watson attempted to steal a 130,000 pound yacht from a high class Portofino resort on the Italian Riviera. To be fair, the keys were on board the yacht, which is like practically asking someone to come steal your yacht. All Watson had to do was start the engine and sail away like sticks. But before Captain Larissa Sparrow could make her grand escape, an employee was able to leap from the dock on board the boat. He grabbed the keys from Watson and turned the yacht back to port. Watson picked up a grand theft charge for his crime and the nickname the Portofino Pirate. Authorities searched through Watson's social media and discovered that she had undertaken navigation courses, so she was familiar with boat handling and that her boat heist was planned. Since Watson's string of crimes and arrests, she was released on bond and her whereabouts are unknown. If she doesn't appear in court for her fraud charges, she will receive an international warrant for her arrest and could face up to three years in jail. Who are some of the scammers who should have gotten away? Let's get right into it and start with number five, not a routine. Platini Stallone de la Torre Cordosa was an expert at forging identity documents and using them to scam unsuspecting victims. Unfortunately for him, the authorities were also experts at catching criminals and Platini soon found himself in police custody. Platini was going about his jolly day when he encountered officers conducting a random stop and search operation. At the time, he had two forged Portuguese ID cards and two forged Portuguese driving licenses in his possession. This piqued the officer's interest and they conducted a larger search of his home. Police found equipment for making forged passports, identity cards, and national insurance cards. The investigation discovered bank accounts that were set up using the forged documents and were intended to be sold on as a package. Police also found controlled and contraband substances in his room. The final nail in the coffin for Platini Stallone de la Torre Cordosa was the stash of pictures of him found in his house. In those pictures, he was flaunting the cash he'd gotten from his criminal enterprise. It's always a great idea to take pictures of illegal things you do. In court, the lawyers argued that Platini posting those pictures was a result of his total disregard for the law. The judge eventually sentenced Platini to four years. However, before sending Platini on his merry way to prison, the judge spoke about the harm he'd caused. He said Platini's actions could help international criminals and terrorists achieve their aims and that Platini was a resource for all manner of criminals. In the end, judgment was passed and Platini Stallone de la Torre Cardosa went to jail. Maybe next time Platini won't walk around in public with things that can get him arrested and sent to prison. Number four, a giant mega scam. Adon Lewis Coffum trashed his pizza and ice cream shop to make a racially motivated burglary to file an insurance claim. The suspect, Adon Lewis Coffum, is a former NFL player who played for several NFL teams from 2012 to 2016. The police were notified of the incident when a 911 distress call came in at around 9.30 p.m. The caller reported that the man trashing the pizza shop drove a black Chevrolet Silverado that didn't have a license plate. Later that night, police officers stopped the truck matching that description leaving the area and found televisions attached to damaged drywalls in the back of the truck. They also discovered that the driver of the truck was none other than Edon Lewis himself. After further investigation, the police discovered that the pizza shop had been vandalized. There were swastikas on the door, racial slurs sprayed in wet fresh paint, and someone had even written MAGA on the wall. The video surveillance system was destroyed, the booth cushions were sliced open, wires were cut, and the mirrors were broken. It reminds us of that time we got a cat for Christmas. Don't ask. 
class. At first sight, it looked like your classic hate crime, but officials knew that something wasn't quite right. When asked about what happened, Kaufman coughed out a response that the police didn't take seriously. He claimed that he noticed the damage and the theft earlier in the day, but had called his insurance company instead of the police. The police, however, could smell what Kaufman was cooking, and it smelled like BS. So the police decided to arrest Kaufman. Once he was in custody, police secured a warrant to search his vehicle, and what they found confirmed their suspicions. For some reason, Kaufman was in possession of a yellow crowbar and cans of spray paint. Kaufman had also found himself in possession of likely tools that had been used to trash the pizza shop. Some people may think that this was just a coincidence, but not the police. According to the police, the only reason they'd figured that Kaufman was behind the crime was because of the witness. If the witness hadn't seen Kaufman's car, it wouldn't have been flagged down. And if it had never been flagged down, Kaufman would have gotten away with the perfect crime. Unfortunately for Kaufman, his plan came with some hiccups, and he was caught. Kaufman's lawyer wanted to remind everyone that he should be presumed innocent and that we shouldn't prejudge without knowing all the facts. Who doesn't drive around with crowbars, spray paint, and TVs that have clearly been ripped off the wall? This sounds like an episode of Reno 911. Number three, scam a go round. Cyber criminals who use hacking forums to purchase login details and software exploits keep falling for scams themselves. These criminals often get duped on these forums and they usually have no recourse after getting scammed. We all feel bad for them. These hacker forums are like marketplaces where scammers of all kinds gather to do business. They advertise what goods they have to sell and can even advertise for the services of specialists in certain criminal endeavors. These forums are usually hotspots for fraudsters who want to purchase data databases of stolen passwords and credit card information. However, these business dealings don't always go according to plan. The evidence for this extraordinary phenomenon of scammers scamming scammers comes from a study of three such hacking forums. The forums investigated were two Russian language forums, Exploit and XSS, and one English language forum, Beach Forum. The scams that happen on these forums take many different forms. Some are quite simple, while others can be rather sophisticated. One example is a rip and run scam. Rip and runs are scams where the seller of merchandise or a service receives payment but doesn't go through with the sale. It can be vice versa as a buyer could receive the merchandise and refuse to send payment. Other types of tricks include selling merchandise that either doesn't work or is fake. One scammer on the forum claimed that another seller sold them Facebook data that was already in the public domain, which was probably more their fault that they didn't check ahead of time. Another example was a lengthy post by a scammer claiming that they'd provided a kernel exploit for someone on the forum and the person had refused to pay the agreed $130,000. In other examples, scammers get scammed by multiple accounts working together. An account with a good reputation may refer a victim to another account and that account may perpetrate a scam on the unsuspecting scammer. One scammer wanted to buy a fake copy of the NFT game Axie Infinity. They wanted to purchase this fake game and include a backdoor to siphon off legitimate users' funds. Unfortunately for them, the person they bought the game from included a backdoor or in the back door. Hence, the scammer was getting scammed by the game they bought to scam others. The most interesting scam investigators discovered was one surrounding the Genesis Marketplace. The Genesis Marketplace is an online forum for criminals to purchase things like hotel login details, email addresses, victims' names, and other personal details. This forum is quite popular and has been online since 2017. However, when researchers started researching the forum, they realized that there was a fake version of the site showing up on Google searches. The website was built on basic WordPress template and asked for money to grant access. The real Genesis website, on the other hand, was invite only. But that wasn't the only odd thing with this fake site. The site linked out to other cybercrime websites, and the Bitcoin address people could make payments to change after it was copied and pasted. It was also being advertised on Reddit. This told investigators that the operation was most likely carried out by a group of collaborators, and they were correct. Over the course of their investigations, they discovered 20 more fake sites like the Genesis site. Most of the sites were impersonating real scam forums and often requested new users to pay to join. Investigations reveal that the phenomenon of scammers scamming other scammers isn't rare at all. After all, there's no honor amongst cyber criminals, and it seems scammers don't have any sacred cow. They'll scam whoever, however, and whenever.
It's generally difficult to feel sorry for these scammers who get defrauded on the forum. They're usually on the forum seeking ways to scam other people. So it's sweet karma and they can get scammed in return. Another sweet irony is that the complaints of these scammers could lead investigators to identify them. When they complain about being scammed, they often have to present evidence and information. And this information could likely lead to their identification. So not only are scammers getting scammed wholesale, but they also can't complain too much if they want to keep their identities secret. It's the worst kind of trap to be in, and one can only be glad that scammers get into it. Number two, accounting never stops. In 2017, an official named Alan Boland at the Bank of Ireland noticed an odd pattern across certain accounts. Boland noticed the same spelling mistake across the six BOI accounts belonging to three different people. Boland decided to investigate further and discovered that the spelling mistake wasn't the only similarity. The banking calls of the six accounts sounded the same and they had similar IP addresses. Boland informed the police and further investigations began. After concluding investigations, the police, led by Detective Garda Alan McCarthy, discovered what he described as an identity factory. McCarthy uncovered a scheme run by Keith Flynn and Lindsay Clark. At the time, the six original identities had already taken around 32,000 pounds in loans. Police began to watch the couple and realized that they rented different apartments. They were both lawyers at the time and had unblemished records. Hence, the police wanted to be sure that they could both be linked to the fraudulent accounts. After watching the duo for a while, the police secured an arrest warrant and entered Flynn's apartment. They found scanners, phone, wave documents, and a safe. The key to the safe was handed over, and the police discovered that it contained 92,300 pounds in cash, alongside 21 full Irish driving licenses with different names, 19 bank cards, and 16 credit union cards. Digital copies of four passports were also discovered, alongside 31 SIM cards and a shredder. Flynn and Lindsay ran the scam by opening a bank account, applying for a loan of about 10,000 pounds to 12,000 pounds, and then draining the account of the that loan. They would make about two or three payments, and then after that, the next repayment was missed, and the bank loan would be written off as a bad debt. There would be nothing to suggest that any fraud was going on. The accounts would simply be written off as bad debts. Banks have safeguards against this sort of thing, but Lindsay and Flynn produced documents of supremely high quality in opening the account. The criminal couple got fake IDs and combed the internet for people who looked like them to create their fake identities. For addresses, the couple identified homes that were on sale or empty and called their owner pretending to be the former tenants. Then they asked the owners if any parcel had arrived recently for them. Their operation was so good that the police only caught them because of Boland's lucky discovery. Boland's legwork was the key ingredient that led to the couple getting caught. In total, the couple stole around 390,000 pounds from the banks. However, there's still some confusion over how they spent it. Investigators say there's some speculation that the money was being sent overseas, but there's no evidence to corroborate it. Another theory is that they spent the money on living a luxury lifestyle, but there's very little evidence of that as well. While others believe that the money is likely being kept somewhere as a contingency, both Lindsay and Flynn pled guilty guilty to fraud charges immediately. Due to their immense cooperation, Flynn was jailed for only four years and Lindsay only got two years for some reason. The court believed that Flynn was about twice as responsible as Lindsay for the same crime. Maybe he was trying to make up for the gender wage gap? In the event of a trial, Clark was facing 388 charges and Flynn 389. In any case, we doubt Lindsay and Flynn will be running any clear fraud scheme in prison. Or could they? Number 1. Unknown Circumstances Prince Sobies Nestor made a name for himself as a rich billionaire who had an extravagant lifestyle and showed off his wealth. But he passed away in police custody after getting arrested because of one of his videos. From wads of cash to new luxury cars and exotic homes, Prince Nestor showed off everything he had. In a video he posted months before his death, the billionaire shared a close-up of a new luxury car. A stunning white Rolls Royce Phantom 8 that undoubtedly cost nearly half a million dollars. The billionaire then revealed that he planned to buy the ride and take it back to Nigeria. Obiez went on to taunt the FBI and the EFCC, a Nigerian anti-graft agency that investigates all financial crimes. Naturally, his unexplainable wealth would grab their attention, but Prince Nestor wasn't too worried. He bragged that he wasn't bothered by any anti-graft agencies like the EFCC and FBI. Prince Nestor said, Said if they questioned him, he would settle them, whatever that means. This was months before his mysterious death. On January 8th, 
2021, he posted a brow-raising video of himself in his opulent Dubai home surrounded by an unbelievable amount of money. He made a show of counting and waving the wads of dollar bills around. He was probably just showing that he knows all of his numbers and can count. People brag about weird stuff these days. Unsurprisingly, the video garnered a lot of attention because people really like watching other people count stuff. But some of that attention was from people you don't really want to notice you. Four days later, Prince Obiez posted his video. The police stormed into his house in Dubai and promptly arrested him. It all happened so fast and in no time. Prince Nestor was completely isolated from his friends and family. They didn't even let him contact or speak to his lawyer. He was held in custody by the CID for interrogation. Prince Obiez's arrest shook the internet. But what happened just a few days later was more surprising. By the end of January 2021, Prince Obiez had passed away in police custody under mysterious circumstances. To this day, no one is still quite sure what happened to him. What are some of the weirdest scams criminals actually come up with? Let's get right to it with... Number 6. A Vacation to Scambiza Hannah Jones thought she had booked a luxury Ibiza vacation villa for her and her friends, but lost thousands of dollars to an Airbnb scam. The charity worker found the fake property on Airbnb's app. The listing looked legitimate, with photos and positive reviews, and the host, Anna, had a verified identity and super host status. Jones read 31 positive reviews that raved about how gorgeous the villa was and how accommodating Anna had been during their stay. Since Anna specified that she wanted to talk to people directly before they booked, Jones contacted the host for details. This didn't raise any alarms with Jones, as it's a common practice for the host to speak to a potential guest. After some communication, Anna sent Jones a payment link, and the $3,700 for her vacation with her friends was set. The link looked like it was to Airbnb, but it was actually a fake page mimicking the site. After paying, Jones received no further communication about the booking. Sensing something was wrong, she contacted Airbnb's fraud team and sent screenshots. They weren't very cooperative. The popular vacation housing platform had no information about the booking, and the original listing disappeared. Jones spoke to a representative on the phone who laughed at her, the hallmark of a great customer service rep, saying there was nothing they could do about payments outside of the platform. The Sheik Ibiza Villa wasn't the only fake listing on the platform. Jones came across another fake property while browsing villas, which also instructed users to contact the host directly for more information. Other users reported similar situations, where they would find a listing with the host that wanted to talk directly. Once the guests paid the scammers, the listing would disappear and their money would be gone. Airbnb eventually fully compensated Jones and permanently removed the host from its site. The platform released a statement reminding guests to communicate with hosts and make payments through Airbnb exclusively and not to engage away from the site. Number five, Broken Seal. Seal superfan Rekha Halasi lost $2,500 in a fake romance scam after a con artist posed as the musician. We know. We were disappointed too when we found out the story didn't involve an actual seal and a fake seal scamming people like some kids movie from the 90s. In case you forgot, seal is the guy who sang Kissed by a Rose. Halasi was a huge seal fan, having followed his career for years and had eagerly awaited the release of his new album. She took to his Instagram profile to directly message him about how much she enjoyed enjoyed it and congratulate him on his success. But Halasi wasn't actually talking to the real seal himself. A scammer had created an Instagram profile where they posed as the singer. The fake seal quickly responded to Halasi's message and invited her to communicate through WhatsApp. She felt that they formed a connection and Halasi fell even harder for her favorite musician, thinking that there could have been a romantic spark. Halasi, who lives in Hungary, had a video chat with the scammer where he sang her favorite song, Love's Divine. To pull this crazy stunt off by looking and sounding like seal, he accomplished this by using special software to manipulate his voice and appearance. The thought of some guy pretending to be seal singing a song no one has heard of and some lady being all excited would be a little cray cray crazy. That's a song reference for all you seal fans out there. Believing a romantic connection was forming between them, Halasi was surprised to hear that the singer, who's made multi-millions in his career, was having financial issues. But hey, in the name of romance, people get a little cray cray crazy. 
Daisy. Fake Seal asked her to loan him $14,000, but Halassi was unemployed and could only afford $2,500. The scammer wasn't happy with her offer and pressured her to find ways to get more money. He told her to sell her apartment, borrow from friends, take out a mortgage, and other extreme measures. Fake Seal here is kind of entitled, to be honest. Fake Seal bombarded Halassi with messages where he told her how much he loved her and was excited for their future, claiming they could make it work if she gave him the money. Halassi couldn't produce the money he needed, but she still sent $2,500, which was quite the chunk of change for her. When she realized she'd been the victim of a scam, Halassi contacted her local police in Budapest, but they didn't have the resources to investigate the situation. Number four, a musky stench. Jan McGee, a longtime Florida principal, lost her job after unfortunately trying to send $100,000 in school funds to a scammer posing as the one and only Elon Musk. McGee worked at the Burns Science and Technology Charter School in Oak Hill, Florida, and jumped at the opportunity when Elon Musk offered to invest millions into the school. The only catch was that he needed an upfront payment, which makes sense for one of the richest men in the world. The fake Musk and McGee corresponded for at least four months. They spoke about educational initiatives and the school's needs, which seemed to interest the billionaire. The $100,000 upfront fee was a small price to pay for the millions of dollars Musk was supposed to give the school. McGee wrote a check on the school's behalf and unknowingly sent it to the scammer. Luckily, as we had said earlier, she tried to. The money didn't get far, as the school's business manager learned of the arrangement and canceled the transaction before the check could clear. Co-workers and staff members warned McGee that she was talking to an imposter and not the real Elon Musk, but she didn't listen. Against their advice, she didn't stop corresponding with the scammer. McGee had a long-standing interest in getting financial support from Musk for the STEM school and had been reaching out to him for years. In her mind, he'd finally responded to her. When the scam came to light, several administrators threatened to quit if they had to keep working for McGee. She held a meeting with board members, administrators, and the community to apologize for her action. Although she admitted to making a mistake, McGee couldn't save her job. She resigned after staff, board members, administrators, and the community lost respect for her and believed she could no longer affect effectively lead the school. Number three, the barcode bandit. When mother Kylie Milner fell upon hard times, she resorted to a fake barcode scam to buy expensive products at low prices. Milner's husband abandoned her suddenly, leaving her with a substantial mortgage, a mountain of debt, and a daughter to raise. Overwhelmed by suddenly being a single mother and solely responsible for paying off their debt, Milner was desperate. So she used fake barcodes from cheap grocery stores and placed them on more expensive products. Milner paid for her items at self-checkouts, which were less likely to catch her than a cashier. Milner went to multiple stores in the area, using the fake barcodes and stealing items like meat, sheets, dishwashing tablets, cleaning products, and even expensive coffee machines. Her suspicious behavior caught the attention of a store manager who watched her walk around the store and confronted her at the self-checkout. Milner brushed it off, claiming she forgot her wallet and fled the store. Another store employee was confused when she used a fake barcode on a rump roast. The employee noticed the discrepancy and voided the sale, but Milner pretended to have no idea of what happened. After several incidents, grocery store workers witnessed Milner's odd behavior. On one occasion, supermarket staff were confused when they noticed they'd sold an excessive amount of noodle packets, which cost 72 cents each. Staff investigated the matter and connected the transactions to Milner. Multiple grocery stores initiated investigations into her activities, particularly when they noticed a pattern of selling an unusually high amount of a specific low-cost item. The police used various methods to trace her, such as security footage and used her bank card information to connect Milner to the crimes. Once they had the necessary information, law enforcement obtained a warrant for Milner's arrest. Family and friends quickly defended the single mother's actions, highlighting that her husband abruptly abandoned her, forcing her to pick up the pieces. They provided letters to the court expressing empathy towards her and emphasizing her good character. Her sister, Michelle, wrote about Milner being a devoted mother and that she'd been trying to turn her life around. Milner's sister-in-law also characterized Milner as a loving and caring individual who'd made wrong choices due to finding herself in a challenging situation. Milner's father came forward to express that she was sorry for what she did and would turn her life around. She pleaded guilty to 31 counts of fraud and three counts of attempted fraud. Milner also admitted to one count of possessing a drug-related utensil as investigators found a pipe with burn marks in a handbag in her home garage. The store noticing a large number of noodle packets being sold must mean they're not anywhere near a college campus. Number two, Bulgarian Spotify scam. A Bulgarian scamming operation earned millions of dollars 
dollars on Spotify without technically breaking any laws. The scheme exploited Spotify's payout structure as only plays from Spotify premium paid accounts are counted towards the number of plays. Scammers uploaded music clips they own the copyright for onto the music platform, putting them into playlists called Soulful Music and Music from the Heart. Both of them sound like that Celine Dion playlist all moms would probably like. The scammer created thousands of accounts and may have used software bots to play these tracks, manipulating the payout system. The scammers played 43 second tracks continuously, generating huge numbers of monthly listens, earning hundreds of thousands of dollars. They likely made $3 million over four months using conservative Spotify payout figures from the time. Each week, the streaming platform would confidentially send revenue reports and playlist rankings by the amount the playlist had earned to industry insiders. In late September 2017, both of the Bulgarian scams playlists had climbed higher than any playlist created by a major label. This prompted industry insiders to report the unusual activity to Spotify. Despite the effort that scammers put into the operation, their playlist had several red flags. The short duration of the tracks and obscure artists behind them, combined with a low number of subscribers but high number of listens, were all telltale signs. Although the scam was extra sneaky, it wasn't illegal. Members of the operation legally owned the copyright for each music clip, having bought and paid for the tracks. Therefore, they didn't violate or break any copyright structure. Instead, they took advantage of the platform's terms of service and structure to make millions of dollars. Number one, cops capture London phone scammers. A gang of four men posed as police officers to steal money from their elderly victims' bank accounts. Mohammed Rahman, Mohammed Marjan, Mohammed Hussein, and Shariful Islam contacted their victims claiming that they were investigating bank fraud. They ran their operation by calling police and telling them that someone had transferred counterfeit currency into their bank accounts and that they needed help catching the culprits. To do that, the fake police would arrange for someone to collect cash from their homes, assuring them the money would be returned by the end of the investigation. Investigation. However, the courier was one of the gang members, and the victims never saw their money again. The four men used burner phones and made over 7,000 calls to potential victims nationwide. They stole over $360,000 from at least 60 people. Their scheme wiped out many of the elderly victims' life savings, with at least half of the victims still not having been reimbursed by the banks. Many victims were intelligent retirees who once worked professional careers but still fell for the scam. The Real police investigated the gang's actions and executed a warrant at a London property that they connected to the gang's activities. When the officers entered the property, one of the suspects climbed out of an open window. As officers searched the property, they realized the suspect had fled and focused their attention on the backyard as they slowly filed out of the property. A dramatic chase followed where the suspect ran across multiple rooftops with officers scaling walls and jumping from roof to roof behind him. They dashed across metal scaffolding over a residence patio and ran down narrow alleyways. Instead of repeatedly shouting parkour during the chase like he should have, the suspect instead kept shouting that he wasn't resisting, which was technically true since he wasn't physically fighting arrest. He was peacefully attempting to parkour away. Eventually, officers cornered the suspect and arrested him. Once he was caught, they arrested the other three bank robbers as well. Rahman, Marjan, Hussein, and Islam pleaded guilty to conspiring to commit fraud by false representation and Rahman, Marjan, and Islam also confessed to possessing criminal activity. What are some of the strangest crimes people actually do? Let's start with... Number 6. The Talented Miss Nasirova Victoria Nasirova has made quite a name for herself in the tabloids with her twisted and criminal escapades. Her stories like something out of a spy movie filled with poisons, fake identities, and people turning up not alive. In August 2016, Nasirova hatched this wild plan to poison her lookalike eyelash artist Olga Tsvik with a special cheesecake laced with a potent Russian tranquilizer and then take over her life. Nasirova was pretty smart to use cheesecake. Anyway, Nasirova showed up at Svik's place in Queens pretending she needed some emergency eyelash magic. As a thank you, she brought along a cheesecake from a fancy bakery. Nasirova ate two slices and offered the third to Svik. Within minutes of devouring that tainted treat, Svik started feeling sick. And we're not talking about bubble guts type sick. More like she's puking her guts out type sick. Taking advantage of Olga's weakened state, Nasirova swiped 
her passport, cash, and employment card. She even went the extra mile and tried to make it look like Olga killed herself by scattering pills everywhere. What's really crazy is that Nasirova actually ate two of the three slices of cake, so it was like playing Russian roulette. Luckily, Tsvik survived the poisoning ordeal. It was her sister who stumbled upon the scene, quickly called the cops, saving her life. This wasn't Nasirova's first time doing something like this either. She was linked to another similar case back in Russia, where her neighbor, Ala Aleksinko, met a terrible end. Nasirova managed to escape the clutches of justice by fleeing to the good old US of A. Nasirova was also accused of pumping guys she met on dating sites full of substances, making them drowsy and robbing them too. You're probably thinking, wow, she sounds great. Can she be Russia's sweetheart and America's sweetheart? Well, no, she can't. She has to choose. Justice eventually caught up with Nasirova. Aleksinko's daughter, who was also living in New York, was horrified to discover that this Nasirova was living just a stone's throw away in Brooklyn. Aleksinko had hired a private eye to track Nasirova down, and that's when she was finally hauled in. In the courtroom, Nasirova strutted in, dressed casually like she didn't have a care in the world. But the judge wasn't messing around. He slapped her with a 21-year prison sentence, cutting her some slack by shaving off four years from the maximum punishment of 25 years for some reason. You'd think she'd show some remorse, but oh no. Instead, Nasirova started yelling and cursed out the judge right in the courtroom. Number five, trying not to exist. Julie M. Wheeler, a woman from West Virginia, got herself caught up in a real mess. She was entrusted with taking care of a patient who had spina bifida, and she was getting paid a hefty sum of over $736 a day by the Department of Veterans Affairs to do it. But instead of doing her job and providing the care the patient needed, she decided to just lie and say she did. But Julie got caught and was facing some serious charges for healthcare fraud and was looking at a possible 10-year prison sentence. That's a long time to spend behind bars. So she came up with a crazy plan to fake her own death. Julie thought she could escape the consequences of her actions by pretending to fall over a cliff at the New River Gorge National Park in West Virginia. The authorities launched a massive search operation that lasted for three days in an attempt to recover the body. They had helicopters, search dogs, and even a diving crew. They were really putting in the effort to locate her, but little did they know it was all a big bamboozling. As it turns out, Julie was hiding in a closet in her own house the whole time. She had planned this whole disappearance in advance thinking she could just vanish and avoid facing the consequences of her actions. But the truth always has a way of coming out. Once they found her, Julie and her husband Rodney were arrested. They were hit with charges of conspiracy and providing false information to the police. Even Julie's son was dragged into this mess. He was implicated in the criminal complaint, accused of helping plant evidence to make it seem like his mom had fallen from the cliff. Julie pleaded guilty to the fraud charges she was facing. She finally admitted to her role in the scheme and the harm she caused. The whole situation is a reminder that actions have consequences. Julie thought she could outsmart everyone by facing Making her passing, but she ended up getting caught and bringing trouble upon herself and her family instead. Number four, it's no biggie. Clayton Jacobs, a cunning fraudster from Florida, executed a strange plan when he checked into the glamorous Mondrian Hotel in Manhattan. The strange part about it was this. He used the name Biggie Smalls, the name famously associated with the late rapper. For a whopping three months, Jacobs reveled in the lap of luxury, amassing an astonishing bill totaling over $47,000. You'd think someone would have made the connection, but the hotel staff completely missed the significance of the name. American Express eventually started rejecting Jacobs' credit card card charges after his extravagant spree, but it took the hotel an additional month before they finally caught on and took action. It's weird that no one realized the association with the legendary rapper Christopher Wallace, who tragically lost his life in 1997. Even the hotel employees who had seen the name Biggie Smalls on the guest list failed to connect it to the iconic rapper. It wasn't until after the news of Jacob's scam broke that they realized the extent of their oversight. One can't help but wonder how such an audacious scheme went undetected for so long. During his stay, Jacob's indulged in the fine thing, but the specific details of his purchases aren't disclosed in the lawsuit. Nevertheless, it's safe to assume that his extravagant bill included lavish room service, exquisite dining experiences, and indulging in the hotel's upscale amenities, all on someone else's tab. Jacobs managed to enjoy the Mondrian Hotel's lavish accommodations for a staggering three months before his grand charade was exposed. The hotel has taken legal action against him to recover the outstanding balance of $47,197.95. How he managed to maintain his deceptive facade for such an extended period remains a mystery. As of now, there are no reported criminal complaints against Clayton Jacobs regarding his scam, the motive behind his choice of the Biggie Smalls alias, and his ability to fly under the radar for several months continue to intrigue those following this odd tale of deception and indulgence. It's a case that'll forever be notorious! Number 3. The Fresh Breath Bandit 
The Fresh Breath Bandit, a nickname given to a suspect by the York Regional Police in Markham, Ontario, has gained notoriety for his minty act of shoplifting. On the evening of December 17th, he entered a pharmacy and carried out daring heist. Surveillance captured the thief walking down several aisles before stopping in front of a rack of candy. In a meticulously planned operation, he started filling up garbage bags with packages of chewing gum. After loading one bag, he left and returned moments later to fill another. The stolen gum, valued at $1,528, was a significant haul, and the York Regional Police have released the security footage to the public in the hopes of identifying the suspect. While theft obviously isn't uncommon, it's a little strange to think about what he planned to do with all that gum. Interestingly, this isn't the first time a similar crime has occurred. According to reports, a comparable gum theft took place at the same store a year earlier. Additionally, there were reports of gum being stolen from a nearby store on the same night. The repetition suggests the possibility of a serial gum thief, and the crime remains unsolved. It left detectives with nothing to chew on. Number two, the fake kidnapping. Larry Wayne Price Jr., a resident of Tazewell County, embarked on a journey of deception and fraud, leaving a trail of chaos in his wake. First and foremost, Larry Price Jr. is a scammy type of guy. As in, he's always wearing his scamming underoos. Price engaged in a series of schemes defrauding multiple companies in the coal mining industry. With a plan in motion, he embezzled a staggering sum of $20.3 million from these companies. Now, let's dive into the perplexing case of Price's alleged abduction. He came up with with an elaborate story claiming to have been kidnapped and robbed for his keys and firearm before being thrown out of a van into the street. But when the FBI questioned him, he changed the story. Now, it was the notorious Pagan's Motorcycle Club that kidnapped him. As a side note, it's probably not the best idea to call out a notoriously, let's call it, a hands-on motorcycle club for a crime they didn't commit. You probably don't want these guys even knowing your name, let alone accusing them of something they didn't do. They probably would have a problem actually doing it. Price resided in a mansion, and it was a testament to his ill-gotten wealth. Situated in the grandeur of Billings, Montana, this residence spanned an astonishing 26,000 square feet. Valued at over $10 million, it stood as a monument to his extravagant lifestyle. Nevertheless, Price's lavish way of life masked an enormous load of debt. He found himself indebted to a Wyoming-based company named Three Blind Mice, owing a staggering $11 million. Additionally, he owed substantial amounts to two medical professionals in Montana and an individual in Billing. As the investigation unfolded, cracks in Price's story grew. The story had more cracks than a plumber's convention. Faced with the truth closing in on him, Price was forced to change the story yet again. The reality of his whereabouts during the supposed abduction came to light, revealing that he had really been with his mistress the whole time, and they were hatching a plan to disappear together. The unraveling of Price's deceit was revealed by text messages that revealed the inconsistencies in his accounts. These digital breadcrumbs made made it impossible for him to deny the truth any longer. As his web of lies unraveled, Price found himself in a precarious position, desperately grasping for a new narrative. Enter his mistress, who became a central figure in his revised version of events. She corroborated his new story, adding another layer of complexity to the already convoluted tale. It became evident that Price was willing to exploit anyone and everyone to maintain his charade, blurring the lines between truth and fiction. Moreover, Price's flagrant disregard for the law extended to firearms. Despite having a prior conviction that prohibited him from owning firearms, he maintained an extensive arsenal of 57 weapons. Larry Wayne Price Jr. received a five-year prison sentence, so in a sense, he did disappear. Number one, sleepwalking? Marius Petricus, from Killingworth in the UK, created a havoc-filled spectacle when he targeted a local pub. Petricus broke into City Tavern, situated in the heart of Newcastle late at night. Once Petricus got inside, he walked behind the bar and grabbed the drink and inexplicably went on a rampage. His path of destruction knew no bounds as he trashed the bar, overturning furniture, and barricading himself with beer barrels and anything he could find. Then the pub's owner, David King, arrived the next morning and faced the grim reality of financial losses exceeding 20 21,000 pounds. This was an especially devastating blow considering the pub was already struggling due to the pandemic shutdown. King called the cops, and when they arrived, they were met with a surprising sight. Petricus, fast asleep on a sofa inside the bar, like a destructive little cherub. But when they tried to apprehend him, things took an intense turn. The police had to taser Petricus, a jaw-dropping six times in their desperate attempts to subdue him. Remarkably, Petricus remained defiant in the face of this repeated electrical massaging. Driven by a desperate desire, 
desire to escape, Petricus took a daring leap out of a window. Hey, it worked in Die Hard. However, it resulted in a head injury. Petricus's bid for freedom was short-lived as he recklessly charged at the police officers who swiftly took him into custody. This wasn't the first instance of Petricus unleashing such destructive tendencies as he had previously been in a physical altercation that caused criminal damage against a former landlord. Petricus pleaded guilty to the burglary charges. The court system swiftly delivered its judgment, sentencing him to 12 months behind bars, but due to the time already served in jail, Petricus was released almost immediately. And we're pretty sure we know what bar he didn't go to when he got out. Who are some of the criminals we had no clue about? Let's find out, starting with... Number 5. 40 Years of Hiding America's Most Wanted Fugitive, Donald Santini, was finally caught by the police after roughly 40 years on the run. Santini's criminal career stemmed back to the 1970s when he served jail time for a crime he committed in Germany while he was in the army. He was also charged with robbery in Texas. In 1984, authorities believed he completed a hit on Cynthia Ruth Wood, a mother who was in the middle of a custody battle. He evaded capture for the next 40 years by adopting various aliases and traveling the country. Although he had a wife and child in Texas, he fled to California to start a new life. Santini changed his name to Wellman Simmons and worked at various jobs, including apartment manager, running an antique store, and serving as president on a water board. He married another woman and the pair had several children. Santini opened a Thai restaurant with his second wife in La Mesa, and while he appeared to be a wealthy businessman, the fugitive was in a lot of debt. He owed one guy $24,000 for giving him a personal loan for his restaurant. When Santini worked as an apartment manager, a former tenant sued him for over $91,000. The tenant had moved into the building, and Santini agreed to pay him $25 an hour for some work. They arranged for Santini to forward the guy his checks to cover his rent, but Santini just kept the money instead. Eventually, the property company that Santini worked for evicted the tenant for unpaid rent, prompting the lawsuit. Before long, Wellman Simmons owed dozens of people hundreds of thousands of dollars and declared bankruptcy three times. In a 2004 filing, he listed over $161,000 in liabilities and included a long list of his debts, including 10 grand owed to the San Diego Union Tribune newspaper and an undisclosed amount owed to American Express. In 2018, Santini was even on TV being interviewed by ABC San Diego after two people who lived in an apartment building that he managed had passed away. Law enforcement eventually tracked Simmons down when he applied for a passport renewal. His daughter, Whitney Simmons, had no clue about her father's double life. When she discovered that U.S. Marshals arrested him in relation to Cynthia Ruth Woods' passing, Whitney was certain someone had set him up. She thought that his other children were angry with him and decided to inform the FBI about her father's whereabouts. A week after Santini's arrest, Whitney's brother and sister put her family home on the market and sold their father's belongings. Whitney challenged the evidence against her father regarding Woods's case and insisted that the husband set it up. In court, he admitted to being Donald Santini, not Wellman Simmons, despite living under that name for two decades. After almost 40 years on the run, Donald Santini is set to live out the rest of his days behind bars with a 50 year prison sentence after pleading guilty. It makes you wonder, how does he feel about it? The guy lived a pretty full life on the run, but also had to live with the knowledge of the crime he committed. What do you think? Is he finally at peace now that he's been caught and sentenced? Or was this guy a total psychopath that's mad he got caught? Tell us in the comments below. Number four, Uber cheats. Brittany Narbet used a friend's credit card details to order thousands of dollars of food deliveries. The fraud started when the victim let Narbet use his debit card to make an Uber Eats delivery. Narbet saved his details and for the next year and a half used them to order 211 meals and averaged 12 deliveries a month. Narbet mainly ordered McDonald's, although sometimes treated herself to meals from places like Pizza Hut, Subway, and several other local restaurants. Somehow, the friend didn't notice the Uber 
overreach charges to his bank account until a mutual friend discovered what had happened and let the victim know. He realized Narbit stole $7,300 to pay for her food deliveries and contacted the police. Narbit pleaded guilty to 14 counts of fraud by false representation and expressed her regret for what she did. She also alluded to the fact that it wasn't just her involvement in the scam, but said she didn't want to put herself or her children through more stress. The judge sentenced Narbit to a 12-month mental health treatment program and ordered her to repay all the money she stole from the victim. Make sure you avoid situations like this by remembering to have alerts switched on for every purchase made using your debit or credit card. And obviously, don't save your payment details on someone else's phone. Number three, Hollywooding. Anne Dunlop conned her family out of $43,000 in a bogus Hollywood actress fraud. Dunlop, who lived with her husband and an unnamed female roommate, told family members that her roommate was about to have her big break in Hollywood and was being lined up for some million-dollar contracts. She claimed that the future star's manager was U.S. entertainment executive Irving Azoff and that the woman was mingling with A-listers such as Beyonce and Leonardo DiCaprio. Dunlop convinced her brother, David Bunton, that the roommate needed cash to tide her over until the money from her Hollywood contracts arrived. David was a former life science company CEO who sold his business for some pretty good money and gave her a loan. Anne also targeted her sister Jean and brother-in-law Steve Allen, who thought that Dunlop and her roommate had champagne on tap at their fancy London residence. Although Anne's roommate was bound to be a star, Anne asked Jean and Steve to help pay her bills because she just didn't have the money. After learning that Irving Azoff was representing the actress, David handed the pair $6,100 to help build her career. The two women also mentioned working on movies with Michael Keaton and Quentin Tarantino. The alleged actress said she went to the Oscars to network and had met Leonardo DiCaprio while working on a marketing campaign for Chanel. Anne also told her family that the woman was going to star in the movie version of Wicked, directed by Tim Burton. David didn't know the exact figure that the fraudster would earn for the movie, but believed it would be millions of dollars. So, being a good brother, he loaned Dunlop $33,000 when he learned she and her husband were struggling to make ends meet. David also covered at least one of their utility bills. Then, months passed, and nothing was even attempted to be repaid. The woman was supposed to appear in the Chanel Christmas commercial, but when it aired, David noticed that she wasn't in it. So naturally, he grew suspicious of his sister and her friend and hired a private investigator to keep an eye on the woman. He wanted to know if the alleged soon-to-be star was actually represented by Azoff or if his sister had lied to him. David and Alan were under the impression Anne and the woman lived a movie star lifestyle in London. When they visited Anne's place for her birthday party, there was an endless supply of champagne. The two men also noticed that the woman liked to shop at Harrods, an expensive luxury department store, and had designer handbags. While living extravagantly, the women turned to Alan for help covering Dunlop's $730 gas bill that she said she couldn't afford. Dunlop said she would repay Alan in two weeks as she had a large sum of money in her bank account, but it wasn't available immediately because it was tied up in an investment fund. She also told her family members that Tim Burton collected her roommate's debit and credit cards and put them in a safe, which is such a weird thing to say Tim Burton did with no explanation. And was eventually found guilty of defrauding her family out of $43,000. She said in court that she really believed the actress had starred in the movie she told her family about. She added that she asked her family for money when her husband got sick and stopped working. Anne also mentioned that the woman was going to appear on a US TV show and had already filmed an episode for it. Dunlop and her accomplice agreed to pay David and Alan all of the money they took. People never expect their own siblings to scam them, unless your sibling is Logan Paul. Number two, Breaking Bad, the math version. Math teacher Jeffrey Scott Blake kept a host of illegal substances and related paraphernalia in his RV. He had worked for Citrus County School District in Florida since 2001. Law enforcement first discovered a glass pipe in Blake's pocket that had traces of illegal substances and discovered three clear plastic bags inside two eyeglass cases which contained multiple illegal substances. They executed two search warrants at the veteran teacher's home where they discovered large quantities of illegal 
illegal substances and items associated with selling those illegal things. Authorities arrested Brake, holding him on a $21,000 bond. Although all school district employees had to go through FBI Level 2 background checking, Brake's illegal activities were undetected. Brake faced multiple charges related to his selling. The school district conducted a separate investigation to determine the future of Brake's employment, which is just words because how on earth would this guy ever keep his job? Several of his former students came forward to say that they knew something was up with him. They described him as hyper and sometimes skittish. Maybe combining his illegal activities in his personal life with being a math teacher was a bad decision. In addition to his charges, Brake was arrested again for the worst type of illegal pictures you can imagine on his electronic devices. He faced 75 years in prison. However, there wasn't public information as of the release of this video in regards to the outcome of his case. Number one, Grandma embezzles $200,000. Patricia Bennett stole $200,000 from her employer to pay for vacations and a DIY pop-up bar in the back of her refurbished backyard. The grandmother worked as an account manager at J. Shaw Electrical Engineers for almost 25 years. She started with the firm in 1998 and was responsible for invoicing, balancing accounts, paying wages and suppliers, and looking after employees' retirement funds. Her boss was David Whitehead, the managing director of the organization. Throughout her employment, Whitehead always felt he could trust Bennett. When she retired, a new account manager took her place and noticed a bunch of discrepancies in the company's accounts. The new employee realized that some suppliers were paid twice, but when she contacted those companies, she discovered they only received payment once. White had discovered that the extra payments were dispersed between two accounts under Bennett's name and one in her husband's name. During an investigation, Whitehead and his team learned that Bennett created profiles for companies that Jay Shaw Electrical Engineers worked with but used her own account numbers for payments. The small payments made it easy for the transactions to go unnoticed. Bennett began stealing stealing in 2008 and openly treated herself to vacations on her RV and trips to Spain. As investigators searched for the whereabouts of the missing money, they turned to her social media accounts where she had shared multiple pictures of her vacations in the UK, Spain, and Greece. Bennett also posted images of the elaborate bar she built in her backyard. Bennett's days of enjoying her lavish lifestyle were cut short when she was arrested and charged with fraud. Bennett's lawyer said that she had originally taken money from from her employer as her husband was sick and money was tight. Not excusable, but understandable. But when nobody noticed the extra charges to the company's accounts, she couldn't resist the temptation to keep stealing. Whitehead admitted that if he'd known that Bennett was struggling, the company would have found a way to help her. They were a small family-owned business and felt extremely betrayed, especially since she had access to the accounts of Whitehead's brother, father, and grandfather. Bennett was sentenced to 18 months in jail and formally apologized to her former employer. But Bennett loved to brag on social media about all of her vacations and refurbished backyard. So do you think she was truly sorry or just sorry she got caught? Can things get any worse for these unlucky people? Let's dive in and find out. Starting with number five, the cure for a broken heart is nine million dollars. Keith King won almost $9 million from his wife's lover after an affair ended their marriage. Keith and his wife Danielle lived in North Carolina, a place where jilted husbands can sue affair partners for damages. The affair began when Danielle met Francisco Huizar III in New York City. She later testified in court that she pursued a romantic relationship with Huizar. After learning about the affair, Keith sued Francisco for criminal conversation and alienation of affection, both of which are apparently things you can be sued for in North Carolina. Keith also claimed that the adultery and alleged fight by Francisco made his company, King BMX Stunt Shows, lose revenue, an employee, since Danielle worked for the business, and more BMX stunt shows. While Keith was a successful business owner, Francisco worked as a marketing manager and earned $84,000 a year. It's not peanuts, but he's not rich either. Francisco's attorney said that the Kings' marriage had been breaking down for years because Keith was 15 years older than his wife and that he was controlling and manipulative. The couple, who shared a daughter and had been married for six years when the affair began, fought frequently. 
Keith regularly went through Danielle's phone, tracked her locations, forced her to wear bikinis and stilettos, and wouldn't let her dye her hair any color other than blonde. That kind of behavior didn't work for Kanye either, Keith. Francisco and Danielle met at one of King BMX stunt show's events where Francisco was working. The two grew very close, with Francisco spending as much time with Danielle as possible. He rented a room down the block from her family home, and when Keith decided to treat his wife to a spa day, Francisco would join her. Since Keith kept such a close eye on Danielle's texts, it wasn't long before he grew suspicious of the pair's friendship. Keith physically confronted Francisco about the affair, allegedly prompting Francisco to put him in a chokehold. Francisco was then charged by police. In North Carolina, people can sue for infidelity, referred to as alienation of affection. Keith provided hotel receipts, social media posts, and call logs to prove his wife's infidelity. North Carolina Superior Court Judge Orlando Hudson, who was featured in the Staircase documentary, ruled in Keith's favor. Judge Hudson ordered that Francisco pay Keith $8.8 million. Francisco Francisco and his lawyer plan to appeal the verdict. While the law seems a bit strange and outdated, on some level it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? If more people knew they could be sued for cheating, maybe they would take their marriage vows a little more seriously. Number 4. Judge This Judge New York City ex-parking court judge Emmanuel Amofa started a website that allowed parking violators to get rid of their tickets for a small fee. Once violators paid Amofa, he doctored their muni meter receipts to win their cases, collecting 20% of the original fine. Home improvement contractor Giancarlo De Lellis said he constantly received parking tickets, something he saw as just the price of doing business in New York, and hired Amofa as his broker to help fight them. There was no evidence that Amofa was running a scam at first. He would send to Lellis' invoices with the numbers of tickets his company received that week, how much money Amofa saved him, and the outstanding amount that DeLellis owed. Amofa also seemed legit. He's an ex-parking court judge. He published a book about how to beat parking tickets and ran a website, parkingticketbusters.com, which contested summonses for clients. Rather than go to the bulk ticket courtroom, Amofa fought each ticket by email and submitted a defense online. His system evaded detection because each ticket was dispensed disputed separately online and dispersed among as many as 200 judges. He won the dismissal of hundreds of Delelis' tickets and only lost on a few. Amofa's scam was successful until a parking ticket judge noticed that the proof in one case seemed suspicious, so he sent it to the fraud division for parking violations. A meter receipt showed that Delelis appeared to pay the meter when the parking ticket was issued. The judge discovered that not only was that receipt doctored, but so were hundreds of other ones that Amofa submitted. Amofa appeared to take real receipts and altered them to cover the time and dates of the tickets. The department uncovered that many of the submitted receipts were from machines that weren't in service at the time, or showed rates not charged at those meters, or allowed for more hours than were available. Officials said that the vehicle owners were still legally responsible for the unpaid tickets and high penalties associated with the scam. When Delelis learned of Amofa's operation, he knew he was going to be held responsible for paying his tickets back in full. However, penalties meant that he owed much more than his original tickets. Delelis had three years worth of tickets that totaled $25,400, but with penalties applied, he owed $132,000. He said that he had to lay off two workers and had to take three company trucks off the road for fear they'd be towed. Although the city argued that people should have known better, many of Amofa's victims reasonably claimed to trust him because of his status as an ex-judge. Over the course of three and a half years, Amofa submitted phony documents to get 816 summonses dismissed. His clients collectively owed $112,000 plus $282,000 in penalties, bringing their total to $394,000. Amofa received a five-year ban for acting as a ticket broker, but wasn't arrested for his fraudulent operation. And we're not saying there was anything fishy going on as far as Amofa's punishment, but this guy was pretty clearly scamming people. To say people should have known better is like saying, well, you know, he is an ex-judge. It sounds more like someone had some friends high up looking out for him. Number three, switching deeds. 
Jess and Jacqueline Moorcroft thought they'd bought their dream home until they learned they were the victims of a mortgage scam. The Moorcrafts purchased the $1.26 million property in Queensland, Australia. They moved in and raised their two daughters in the three-bedroom home. After living there for years, the Moorcrofts discovered they never legally owned the property. According to the previous owner, a relative used the property as collateral for a loan, which later defaulted. Without the couple's knowledge, the home sold for $2.6 million at an auction five years after the Moorcrofts moved in. Before the family moved into the home, the Moorcrofts were told another party may have a claim to the house. They were then told they could proceed with the sale six months later and moved in, even though the property was never officially in their names. The previous owner sued the couple, claiming a relative fraudulently mortgaged the property without her consent. Despite the legal drama, the family lived in the house for five more years and even renovated the garage into a playroom for the kids. The Supreme Court of Queensland ruled that the couple's property ownership was null and void as the fraud of another person is what got the mortgage. Additionally, the court found that the Moorcrofts had no legal interest in the property because it was never officially transferred into their names. Although they thought they owned the house outright, when the property was sold again, the Moorcrofts realized they had lost everything. They moved into a rental property and began legal proceedings. The Supreme Court ruled that the state owed the Moorcrofts $2.7 million for damages of breach of contract and ordered the government to pay. The ruling confirmed that the state was liable as the couple was deprived of their equitable interest in the property. In response, the government said that the Moorcrofts had to seek recovery for damages from the original owner first. The government claims that since the Moorcrofts never actually owned the property, they weren't direct victims of fraud. That's some mental gymnastics there, isn't it? Having already spent a back-breaking $300,000 in legal fees, the couple started a petition demanding the state pay, which gathered over 17,000 signatures. At the time of this video, the Moorcrofts are still trying to get their money back. And it's such a cliche government thing to say, isn't it? Oh, we don't have to pay because you weren't a direct victim. You only spent your life savings on a house, lived in it for five years, and were forced out by the real victim. Uh, also, you owe us taxes for that thing you did a few years ago. Number two, not her couch. Scammers hacked Monique Sherman's Facebook to post fake ads for items that didn't exist. Hackers compromised Sherman's details and locked her from her Facebook and Instagram profiles. Then they posted ads on her accounts, letting buyers think they were buying stuff. The scam started when Sherman was posting on her accounts one morning. The page started flickering, and then she was asked to put in her password. But when she tried to, it didn't work. She started getting confusing notifications on her phone, claiming she was selling things. Sherman watched as scammers sold a couch from her account that she had never even seen before. It was annoying, but it wasn't a real problem. Then strangers started coming to her door to pick up the stuff they purchased. Victims paid online and turned up at her door, one demanding the sofa they spent $300 for. Three other people showed up as well, also demanding the stuff they paid for, each becoming irate when Sherman didn't have anything they bought or their money. Fearing other angry deceived buyers would show up, Sherman fought to remove the ads. Some remained, including the ad for the sofa. There were enough angry victims that she had to install a home security surveillance system and put up pictures of the police report she filed on her front door. Sherman widely republished the sofa ad, warning that it's a scam and encouraging others not to fall for it. But really, who pays for things on Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist before checking it out in person? What are some of the weirdest crimes people do? Let's get right to it with number five, the decaying practice. James Tolliver Craig, a dentist from Aurora, Colorado, allegedly went after his 43-year-old wife, Angela James, by poisoning her. James took his wife to the hospital as she was complaining of dizziness and severe headaches. When they got to the hospital, her condition quickly deteriorated and doctors moved her to the ICU and placed her on a ventilator. Not long after, Angela's medical team couldn't find any brain activity and she was taken off life support. They were suspicious of her rapid deterioration and reported the incident to the police. An investigation into James's online searches gave a much clearer picture of what exactly had happened to his wife. He'd searched for places to buy oleander, a poisonous plant, looked up how much pure arsenic is necessary to be fatal for a human, and searched to see if arsenic would be detectable in an autopsy. It wasn't the first time James attempted to poison his wife. His sister informed police that James had poisoned Angela five to six years before and tried to make it look like she did it herself. The last time, 
James had given Angela an unknown substance. He told her he had planned to, let's just call it, off himself. So he had given her the unknown substance so she wouldn't find him or try to save him. The lethal substances in James's system would have kicked in before the substances in Angela's bloodstream wore off. As James's actions would suggest, the couple's marriage was unhappy. He was on the edge of bankruptcy for a second time, and Angela had told her sister that their financial situation was dire. James ordered a shipment of arsenic to be dropped off at their home and had potassium cyanide delivered to his office. Before admitting Angela to the hospital, James informed his office manager that he was expecting a package and instructed her not to open it. However, when the package arrived, another employee opened it anyway. The office manager looked inside and found a circular canister with a biohazard sticker and a potassium cyanide label. On March 6, 2023, James made Angela a protein shake before they worked out together. He gave her extra protein and she was feeling sluggish. But by the end of their workout, she was so faint and sluggish that he took her to the hospital. One of James's longtime friends and business partners spoke to one of the attending nurses at the hospital and shared that he thought Angela was poisoned. The business partner informed the nurse about the potassium cyanide canister James ordered to the dental office, despite no medical need or purpose for it to be at a dentist's office. Office. The partner confronted James about the package, to which James claimed it contained a ring for his wife. However, the partner didn't believe him and demanded to know why he would buy cyanide. So James quickly decided to change his story, admitting that yes, the package did contain cyanide, but it was Angela that made him order it as she was suicidal, and he wanted to call her bluff and snap her out of it. As a mandatory reporter, the nurse called the police, who launched an investigation into the matter. The investigation revealed that James had been sending explicit and personal emails to an orthodontist in Austin, Texas that he was having an affair with. They allegedly made travel plans for his mistress to visit him on dates, lining up with Angela's various hospital stints. They also had a trip booked for the day Angela entered the hospital and later passed away. They had purchased their tickets the very same day the arsenic arrived at James's home. It's like all that was missing was for it to be her birthday as well. Before her passing, Angela feared James had poisoned her again. When she first exhibited symptoms in early March, Angela texted her husband that she felt like she'd been poisoned and was going to the hospital. James responded that he hadn't poisoned her again, something that many loving husbands have said before, so it was totally not suspicious, right? But he agreed that she looked pale and expressed concern. Police believed she had arsenic in her system during that time. James filed for professional and personal bankruptcy in 2020. His dental practice, Summerbrook Dental, was running with an approximate $120,000 monthly loss, and James had accumulated over two million dollars in personal debt. James dug himself into a hole with a series of bad investments. He sunk over a million dollars into a cryptocurrency named ExtraOption.Gold, which he hoped would prop up his business. Instead, the investment cost him significant money, and ExtraOption.Gold is now better known as Fool's Gold. Another of his investments was in a crypto Ponzi scheme, where he lost $600,000. James believed he would generate more than $40,000 monthly by purchasing three big text blockbuster machines from James Wolfgram. Wolfgram was accused of pretending to be a crypto millionaire who ripped off multiple victims for millions through his company Bittex. When James asked Wolfgram when he would receive the machines, Wolfgram pledged his $15 million Florida home as collateral for the joint venture in a personal guarantee and collateral agreement. Unfortunately for James, Wolfgram didn't disclose that he didn't and never had owned the home in question. By the time James filed for the bankruptcies, he was hemorrhaged money. He owed the IRS $314,998 and had $750,000 in other debts, including over $200,000 on assorted credit cards. James had three life insurance policies on his wife, valued at a little over $80,000, which would have barely made a dent in covering his debts. James didn't think he was at fault for his financial difficulties and blamed those around him instead. He blamed the dental practice issues on Dr. Chris Brady, who, according to James, 
James suggested he change the business model. James said that the change increased the business's expenses and forced him to bring on a new dentist who was a bad fit. James also claimed that they were buried in debt when they replaced the dentist. He also said he had to take out loans totaling roughly $1.7 million to cover increased expenses. Their business spending didn't exactly match the office's dire financial state. They spent over 60 grand on travel and almost $29,000 on meals and entertainment. James has been charged with the first degree murder of Angela James and faces additional charges related to the poisoning. If found guilty, he could face life imprisonment. Number four, just bury it. The former owner of a $15 million estate in California, Johnny Bakhtun Liu, had an extensive criminal history that dated back to 1965 with charges that included insurance fraud. In 1999, Liu hired people to sink his $1.2 million yacht to cash in on the insurance money. Liu instructed them to drive the 56-foot craft named Corwell past the Golden Gate Bridge and into international waters where they would sink it to the bottom. Unfortunately for Liu, the men he hired were undercover police officers in a sting operation. They hid the yacht, but told Lou they had sunk it. He paid them $30,000 in cash and $20,000 in gold watches and reported the luxury boat stolen to American Yachts Limited. The incident was certainly not Lou's first interaction with law enforcement. In 1965, a jury found him guilty of shooting Karen Gervaisi, a 21-year-old woman, in his Los Angeles County apartment. He tried to convince the court that Gervaisi accidentally did it to herself, but nobody believed him. In 1968, the California Supreme Court reversed the conviction, citing hearsay evidence that shouldn't have been allowed in the trial. While Lou got to walk free, he didn't stay out of trouble for long. In 1977, he was back in court again for going after another person, this time a guy, and the jury found him guilty on two counts, and he spent three years in prison. Lou passed away in 2015 after suffering from lung cancer. Years after his passing in October 2022, police discovered a buried Mercedes-Benz on his former Atherton estate, where he lived with his family in the 1990s. Authorities uncovered that Lou reported the vehicle stolen in 1992 and received between $87,000 and $88,000 in insurance money for the stolen car. He buried the vehicle with unused bags of concrete. The police brought cadaver dogs to the scene and picked up the scent of possible human remains, although authorities didn't find any in the vehicle. It's weird that this concrete evidence wasn't concrete at all. Number three, professional test taking. Inderjeet Kaur, a woman from South Wales, ran a criminal operation where she charged people hundreds of dollars for her to take their driving tests for them. Between 2018 and 2020, Kaur sat through 150 theory and practical driving tests for candidates who struggled with the English language. Once she passed their tests, she handed them their driving licenses. Staff at driving test centers were suspicious of Kaur and reported her to the Driver and Vehicle Standards Agency, known as the DVSA, which is the organization responsible for driving tests in the UK. The DVSA referred the case to local authorities who opened an investigation. And Cower wasn't the only person guilty of test fraud. Around 200 miles away in Derby, England, a staff member at a driving test center noticed a woman who seemed to be taking a test on behalf of someone else. Authorities launched a search to find the woman who had been spotted throughout the UK and released a picture of her in an attempt to identify her. Between Cower and the unidentified woman, they fraudulently took tests in at least 10 counties across England and Wales. Their cases weren't isolated incidents either. As of December 2022, driving test fraud was on the rise in the UK. The fraudulent driving tests caused public safety concerns, as the fraudsters enabled unqualified and potentially dangerous drivers to obtain legitimate licenses. Public officials feared there would be a rise in serious accidents. The DVSA sent out a notice urging people to report drivers they suspect are sitting a test for someone else and warned that it's against the law to cheat during a driving or theory test. They also warned of the serious ramifications of posing as someone else when taking a test, such as prison sentences, court costs, fines, driving bans, and unpaid work. Additionally, the DVSA planned measures to crack down on the situation to prevent any unqualified or unsafe drivers getting behind the wheel. Authorities uncovered Cower's scheme and arrested her. She pleaded guilty, and the court sentenced her to eight months in prison. A man guilty of the same crime, who charged over $1,000 per test, was sent to 18 months in jail. Judging from all all the bad drivers where we live, the women must be operating here too. At least someone is putting the brakes on this scam. Number two, faking a city. 
When the city of Newark entered into a sister city partnership with the United States of Kailasa, or USK, they thought they were establishing a relationship with the first sovereign state for Hindus. However, they'd soon learn that the nation was nothing of what it seemed. The USK nation was created to honor Paramhamsa Netiananda, the so-called Supreme Pontiff of Hinduism, or SPH. The country claimed to have a population of two billion practicing Hindus and had its own flag, central bank, and passport. Unfortunately for Newark, the country didn't exist. The Kailasa group, which followed Netiananda's teachings, claimed to have extended campuses in 150 countries and promoted a form of Hinduism centered around its leader's alleged miraculous powers. His powers included delaying the sunrise and teaching cattle to speak Tamil. However, the spiritual leader couldn't find a way to miraculously get himself off of the radar of Indian police, who wanted him on pretty serious charges dealing with, let's just call the non-consent issues and some abductions. Why did Netiananda want sister city status? Since the Kailasa group looked very much like a cult, if they gained sister city status, they would appear more credible and be able to recruit people in the United States. For Netiananda, having American recruits meant more money. Netiananda didn't attend the sister city ceremony, where Vijayapriya Netiananda represented USK instead. She identified herself as the permanent ambassador to the UN for the fake country. Vijayapriya described the USK as a country that was service-oriented, borderless, and established on the principle of oneness. Apparently, Vijayapriya also didn't know the difference between a country and a philosophy. Vijayapriya had a large tattoo of Nityananda's face on her bicep, which she had done in 2016 after participating in a program with Nityananda with thousands of other attendees. She claimed he made such a profound impact on her life that she wanted the tattoo as a daily reminder of his teachings. Many other followers use tattoos to express their spiritual affection for Nityananda, either of his face or of his mystical third eye, which he claimed could heal the blind. With such a devout following, it's no surprise that Newark wasn't the only place to fall for the idea that USK was a real place. 30 cities signed some sort of acknowledgement of the USK, including Pomona, California, Richmond, Virginia, and Delaware, Ohio. The USK scammed local, state, and national governments into entering sister city programs and other unofficial proclamations for almost 20 years. Even Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau sent a letter of support to USK for its Hindu Heritage Month celebration, and California Representative Norma Torres sent a certificate of special recognition. Kailasa's representatives went to Geneva to meet with the United Nations, where they described their nation as the first sovereign state for Hindus. No wonder they were proud and passionate about their nation when they believed their ruler was so powerful. On top of preaching that he could delay the sunrise, teach cattle to speak Tamil, and heal the blind, he also claimed to have ESP and X-ray vision, like a Hindu Superman. Six days after Newark signed the sister agreement, the city learned that the USK wasn't a real country or city and dissolved the partnership. Today, Nityananda is a fugitive from justice. While hiding from Indian law enforcement, he still preaches online as his followers build out a network of nonprofits within the US. Number one, Pras Michel Super Spy? Rapper and former member of the Fugees, Pras Michel accepted millions of dollars from Zhou Lo, a Malaysian financier, to help him make political connections and influence people. Michel met Zhou Lo at a New York City nightclub in 2006. Their relationship developed into a business partnership where Lo paid Michel with money he stole from the Malaysian government to make influential and political connections. Lo leaned on Michel heavily for his political connections and influence. Michel helped Lo by doing things such as reimbursing guests to attend a fundraising dinner for President Obama's 2020 presidential campaign. Allegedly, Michelle funneled $1 million of Lowe's funds into Obama's campaigns through 20 donors to avoid suspicion. When the Trump administration took office, Lowe gave Michelle over $100 million to convince then-President Donald Trump to drop a federal investigation into Lowe. Understandably, Lowe did everything he could to guarantee legal protection against the U.S. government. He allegedly ran one of the biggest financial scams in history, which involved turning the Malaysian government's slush budget into his bank account. Lowe allegedly stole billions of dollars from 1MDB, the Malaysian government's investment fund. He used the money to buy luxury real estate, yachts, private jets, artwork, and his lavish, celebrity-filled lifestyle. Lowe even funded the Leonardo DiCaprio and Martin Scorsese box office hit The Wolf of Wall Street. Michelle accepted between $8 million and $40 million for his role. Lowe sent Michelle on 
on missions, such as to convince the U.S. government to hand over Chinese billionaire Miles Guo to Chinese authorities. Guo resided in the U.S. and was an ally of Steve Bannon. Guo and Bannon developed a close relationship and worked together to expose corruption in the Chinese government. Bannon publicly praised Guo, and Guo appeared on GTV, Bannon's media platform. They discussed China-related issues, and Guo was a vocal critic of the Chinese Communist Party and accused the government of corruption and a blatant disregard of human rights. Bannon and Guo collaborated on several initiatives, such as launching a media company to challenge the Chinese Communist Party and a documentary exposing the government's handling of the COVID-19 outbreak in Wuhan. As a favor to Chinese leaders, Lo wanted to hand Guo over to Beijing as a form of protection against the U.S. government as U.S. prosecutors were investigating Lo's business dealings. Allegedly, Lo helped fund the Leonardo DiCaprio Foundation and allegedly used stolen funds to buy artwork auctioned off at a charity event for the foundation. DiCaprio returned the artwork to the U.S. government as part of a settlement to resolve claims that stolen money was used to purchase the artwork. When DiCaprio learned of Michelle's involvement in the scheme, he contacted the Justice Department and worked with investigators to determine if his foundation received gifts or charitable donations directly or indirectly related to Lowe and his associates. Despite the accusations, Michelle denied ever acting as an agent for China and claimed he thought he was helping the U.S. His defense attorneys argued that he had followed the advice of his attorneys and acted in the U.S. government's interest. Additionally, Michelle's lawyers stated that Michelle was unaware of the extent of Lowe's scheme and believed the money Lowe gave him was intended for legitimate projects. Lowe is on the run, having been charged with money laundering and other financial crimes by U.S. and Malaysian authorities. The U.S. government has seized assets he bought with stolen money, such as a $250 million yacht and a $30 million penthouse. While he claims his innocence, many believe Lowe is hiding out in China. Michelle is currently standing trial for his involvement in Lowe's schemes and has pleaded not guilty to conspiracy charges, witness tampering, and failure to register as an agent of China. Just why? Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comments section what you'd rather have, the ability to never have a hangover or the ability to never get drunk.